Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the town board meeting for June 7th, 2022. If we could all please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we just bow our heads in a moment of silence as we remember the greatest generation in the 78th anniversary of D-Day. So we also are keeping our thoughts and prayers, all of our first responders, our police officers, firefighters, EMTs, as well as the bravest men and women the world has ever known, those serving in the United States Armed Forces today. Thank you. Amen. Amen. We are going to be... Um, Changing around the agenda a bit today, so I appreciate everyone's understanding and patience. We'll quickly do introductions, starting with to my right. Good evening, Diana Quas, Town Clerk. Good evening, Tom Diana, Deputy Supervisor, Councilman. Matt Slater, Town Supervisor. Ed Lachtman, Councilman. Sergio Esposito, Councilman. Luciana Howitt, Councilwoman. Adam Rodriguez, Town Attorney. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite Bill Harrington uh, to the podium to present to the Town Board uh, he's going to provide a, a briefing regarding the ethics report, which we had commissioned Bill to do. No, Bill, if you could just if you could just stand right, face right at us, yeah. it's okay because right. the the cameras are there. They're, they can hear you loud and clear. But Bill Harrington of Bleakley Platt and Schmidt, Bill, thank you so much for your work on this matter, and we look forward to hearing from you. You're you're welcome, Mr. Supervisor. Thank you, and good evening, members of the council, um, and good evening, folks and folks online. Um, I was asked by. Um, the board to review the um, public disclosure of a board of, uh, board of ethics decision back in 2021 um, concerning a, a member of the planning board who was the subject of that ethics proceeding. I've completed that. I provide a report to the board this evening, um, and I would like tonight just to explain to you the, the highlights of the report. First, um, there is um, there's no dispositive evidence of the, the inappropriate and improper disclosure of the um, the Board of Ethics advisory opinion to a local newspaper. Um, we've interviewed everybody involved, and there simply isn't ev any evidence to suggest who might have done that. Um, number two, due to COVID, the, the traditional in-person meeting uh, that typically would occur for any board, let alone the Board of Ethics, was compromised. As a result, all the proceedings were done via Zoom or telephone. Um, they were uh, interrupted because of the delays associated with COVID that, and all the personal challenges that we all confronted. And as a result, the process was um, unfortunately a little disjointed, but totally understandable, as was, quite frankly, our government response on virtually every level. So um, <laughs> why should the Board of Ethics get it any better? Um, and quite frankly, um, based upon what I was able to ascertain, they did a, a really an admirable job under the circumstances, and um, their service should be uh, acknowledged and, uh, and, and they should be thanked for it. Um, the takeaways from this are, are three, and they're my recommendations to the Board. Number one, um, the, the, the Ethics code should be amended to make quite clear that the substance and decisions, advisory or otherwise, of the Board of Ethics and the deliberations are confidential. Right now, the code only provides that members of the town government cannot disclose confidential information for their benefit or for mm -hmm. any other purpose. Number two, it says that the hearings in front of the Board of Ethics are confidential, or excuse me, not subject to uh, um, uh, the public. And number three, that personal information is confidential that's gleaned in that process. There is no admonition in the code that makes it clear that neither board members or members of the public or anyone else, clerical staff, are prohibited from disclosing confidential information. That, it, uh, that to do so would be a violation of the board, uh, the, uh, code of ethics itself, and therefore my strong recommendation is the is that the um, the board should consider amending the local ordinance to that effect. Okay. Um, number two, um, the 
communications as it relates to uh, the Board of Ethics, I think should be done all on the town server, meaning unlike what happened during COVID where everyone was working from home in their own personal email, um, my, and, and therefore the, the potential sources for inappropriate disclosure were advanced significantly, if each board uh, member is giving a town email and directed and required to conduct all communications regarding the substance of, a dis, of any decision, drafts of those opinions, et cetera, on, a, on the town server, um, then there, the, the ability for the town to control it and quite frankly detect any inappropriate uh, disclosure is enhanced dramatically. And the notion that people can get around it, although the immediate reaction is, well, I can do this, that, you can't. If, if, if there is a disclosure, there's a way to detect it, um, and we'll just leave it at that. Um, and then finally, th there, there should be uh, an annual tutorial as it relates to the Board of uh, Ethics uh, mandated disclosures, and that should include the notion that you've read the Code of Ethics, you understand that any deliberations, any discussions are privileged and confidential. Because part of this is, um, and the thing that's impressed me about both the Board of Ethics and this board is you're concerned about the propriety of the proceedings. Mm -hmm. These can be abused very easily for political purposes on either side of the aisle. And, and that would be a terrible thing for any level of government, particularly a municipality like Yorktown where folks are coming and greeting each other in other languages, where people are so close and it makes the fabric of this community very unique. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you should preserve that as best you can. So the notion that um, everyone knows going in that you can't disclose this to anybody for any reason, um, to me, would serve that greatly. Excellent. So those are my recommendations. Thank you. Uh, I wish you Godspeed. Good luck. <clears throat> um, Mr. Harrington, we, we do greatly appreciate your time and your energy that went into this matter, uh, something that the board takes very, very seriously. Uh, I, think the, I think the recommendations you provide make sense especially regarding the, the town server. I think that makes a lot of sense. But, uh, I, I would also, and the board will deliberate on this at another point in time, but on the tutorial side, I don't think it should apply just to the ethics board. I think that should be something that we should look into oh, for all of our volunteer boards, just, just so they understand you know, procedures and, mm -hmm. and, and understand the, ethical, you know, the, the ethics code, <clears throat> because it doesn't just apply to the ethics board. It could apply to any of our volunteer boards as well. Correct. Right, so that's something maybe that the, this town that we can deliberate on. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And have a conversation about as well. But I don't I, know if it's every board's, well, you know, some, but we can. Right, we yeah. we can we can talk about that. But I I do appreciate the effort that you put into this. I think it's um, it's comforting to know that there was nothing done uh, that, or at least there was no evidence of anything that was done uh, uh, maliciously. Uh, I appreciate your 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 uh, praise for the ethics board, considering the circumstances. COVID was challenging for everybody, uh, and yet we had volunteers because they are volunteers who were determined to continue to keep the wheels of government moving. So uh, I do think that they should be recognized for that as well, and, and I appreciate your acknowledgement of that. Um, but uh, uh, I think this is a an important step for us in this process. Mm -hmm. This is something that I know that we were all uh, focused on and 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 looking forward to getting to a point where we had some closure on it. So I hope this. Yep provides that for the town board and the public i agree thank you mr harrington thank you folks thank you, have a good night Take thank care. you mr thank harrington you well. Take care. appreciate Bye. it thanks from time to time we have to tweak our codes yeah well we're always yeah. finding reasons and ways to do it or we so. just have to remind people that they're there that, right. or that <laughs> right. there's that well that's very good well again i want to thank uh, the the public for accommodating mr harrington he did have a prior engagement but he was willing to come and provide uh, that, uh, that briefing to the board and to the public. Uh, so we're going to move on uh, back on track <coughs> to the announcements uh, and reports from the board. And I am very happy to start with an important one. Um, we live in a community that has one of the best police departments you can find. Now, I don't say that for no reason. It's also been uh, proven and announced, they've been recognized as a national first-class police agency. Unfortunately, we had uh, a terrible incident that happened uh, here in the town of Yorktown on May 21st, uh, an incident that um, just, it's hard to put into words, uh, to be honest, but it really painted this community in a terrible light. 
Uh, it spread disgusting and despicable uh, racist language, anti-Semitic language, anti-Semitic symbols. The N-word was spray-painted, a swastika was spray-painted, and the phrase gas all Jews was spray-painted over off of Croton Dam Road. Now, this town board and the previous town board that I've served with have been very clear in our stance against all forms of hatred, racism, bigotry. Well, because we live in a great community with a wonderful police department, they did an extraordinary job because they have arrested three individuals linked to this horrible, horrible incident. There will be a press conference tomorrow at 10 a.m. in front of the police department headquarters where Chief Noble is going to provide details uh, on uh, what exactly happened, how the police came uh, into, uh, how the police were able to uh, ascertain the necessary information and, and able to make the necessary arrests. What I will tell you all and the public, as I said, we have three individuals who have been uh, charged, none from Yorktown, all from Croton on Hudson. And I think, again, considering the, the, the incredible police work that went into ascertaining this information and tracking down what occurred uh, is just remarkable. Just remarkable. And I think it really shows, and I hope it sends a strong message to anybody that if you think you're going to come into this community and you're going to spread, spread this vile and disgusting hate, racism, bigotry, so on and so forth, know that we're going to get you. And we're going to pursue every possible avenue and hold you accountable to the law. Now, I have said time and again, hate has no home here. I've been ridiculed for that statement, quite frankly, by some. But I believe in the law, and I believe in our police department. And they proved here and now, and they will provide greater details tomorrow, that hate does have no home here in Yorktown. And if you bring it here, as we've seen in Buffalo and as we've seen here in our own community, someone from outside brings it to our community, we're going to hold you accountable. So I, I just want to thank Chief Noble. I want to thank the entire Yorktown Police Department for the fantastic work. And I'm, again... Looking forward to joining the Chief of Police and our fine officers tomorrow at 10 o'clock in front of the Yorktown Police Department where we will divulge more information uh, on this particular case. Thanks to our Police Department. They're the best. Yeah, they deserve yeah. a round of applause. And I, I do believe that this shows the fabric of our community and it being that it didn't come from our community. So that's the latest on, on that terrible incident. Other announcements and, and news to share. Uh, I want to thank everyone who participated in the ARPA survey. Uh, we had 564 people respond to the online survey about how they felt we should be investing the $3.7 million that we received from the federal government into our community. Uh, the next step is for the task force. We will be having a meeting uh, this month to review the data, to review all the responses that we've received, all the great ideas that we received, because we did receive some very, very good ideas. Uh, and start figuring out ways that we can accommodate them. Our Senior Nutrition Center, uh, I don't, I don't re remember uh, sharing this, but uh, a few months ago we had three of our vans, uh, their catalytic converters were stolen straight from out underneath their car, uh, underneath the vans. So they were, they were disabled. Uh, but we're happy to report it took a while because of the supply chain issues, uh, and Mr. D can probably speak to this <laughs> with regards to catalytic converters, which are a hot <laughs> item on the street these days. Uh, but all of our vans are back in service, and the Senior Nutrition Center is back up and running at full strength. So we're very happy to hear about that. Uh, our water department finished our spring flushing, uh, and that was uh, fantastic. And, and now they're focused on fixing and adding any new fire hydrants based off of the results of mm -hmm. this season's flushing. It's summer here in Yorktown, so our Parks Department's happy to welcome our residents to both the Junior Lake and the Shrub Oak Pool this weekend. 
from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Our railroad park basketball court is nearly completed, and we're hoping to be cutting a ribbon this coming Friday to welcome uh, the to welcome basketball back to railroad park. Our Hanover East Playground is experiencing supply chain delays, like mm -hmm. so many other things in the world, and the needed parts are expected to be in by this July. So our Parks Department, busiest time of the year for them uh, here in the spring and early summer, but they're doing a great job. Our Refuse Department has our garbage contract out for bid. It is due back this uh, at the end of this month, uh, and, they, and that bid did include the changes that were presented to the board uh, earlier this year. Our assessor wanted to remind the residents that the grievance period ends June 24th, 21st, excuse me, 21st, June 21st. Uh, and if you haven't uh, been watching the news, New York State is sending their homeowner tax rebate credit checks. Uh, they are being distributed by the state. The amount of the check is income based for if you're a basic star recipient. If you're a uh, enhanced star recipient, you can expect a check from New York State of approximately twenty-four to twenty-eight hundred dollars, and we expect those uh, this month or next month. Uh, the library is kicking off their summer reading program June twenty-fourth, and as we all remember, they had this great initiative for free hotspots, and they actually had to expand that program, and they've doubled their inventory because of the high demand. So, if you're looking for a hotspot, if you don't have reliable internet at your house or you're going away on vacation, you can actually go to the library and just check out a mobile hotspot just like you would a book. It's a, it's a great program, and I really want to thank Yvonne Sheck, our library director, for putting that into place. I want to thank all of our participants for the Memorial Day parade and ceremonies that took place uh, last weekend. Uh, Yorktown uh, just shined. It really did. Uh, we had ceremonies every hour on the hour from 9, to, uh, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., um, but it was a great day uh, to remember and to honor those who gave their lives so that we can live in a free country. And so I really want to thank, again, all of the participants and our VFW for hosting this year's parade. We're planning some festivities for the 4th of July this year. Uh, the first thing that we're going to be talking about is our 4th of July Freedom Run. It's a 5K uh, in, in partnership uh, with the Taconic Roadrunners. It's a road race right here through the Heights Hamlet, and that will be in support of my brother Vinny, one of our wonderful charities that does work uh, combating homeless veteran, uh, veteran homelessness yeah. <laughs> here in the metro region. Uh, and so again, that will be the 4th of July. You can <sighs> visit the Taconic Roadrunners website to sign up to participate. Sustainable Westchester wanted to remind, uh, wanted me to remind everybody that they are having another Zoom information session on their Westchester Power Program, which is something that the town board is investigating. That will take place on June fifteenth at seven p.m. That is a Zoom meeting, so you can Zoom right from your couch. Uh, that link can be found on the town's calendar at your the homepage of the uh, Yorktown YorktownNY.org. And lastly, if uh, I feel like we've been just dealing with so much tragedy these past weeks, it's, oh, I think it's really important to recognize a good deed. And so I want to recognize Genesis Jewelers. And if you didn't know, Genesis Jewelers, the Gelpers, they are doing a book, book drive. drive in conjunction with 914 Cares. They are looking for children's books. Their goal is to collect over 1,000. And I can tell you that they are doing a pretty good job. Uh, and so anyone who has any children's books that they're willing to donate, uh, they are doing it for the rest of this week, ending June 11th. You can bring it right to their store, Genesis Jewelers, 32 Triangle Center, uh, right here in the Heights Hamlet. And uh, I do want to thank uh, Steve and Lara for providing a good deed, because like I said, we've been hearing about a lot of tragedies in the world. and. And uh, a good deed goes a long way, makes you feel good, it raises people up, and it goes to a great cause. So please, if you have any mm -hmm. uh, children's books that uh, you'd like to donate, stop by, Steve, see Steve and Lara, and you can drop them right off. Uh, I was going to say, if you miss a book drive, they also, every year around Christmas, do a diaper drive as well. Yep. The two things that, those are the two events that they do every year. Yep. Lara was saying it's only because 
they run out of room every year so <laughs> so because they do such a great job that concludes my report to the town and i will turn it over to councilman diana thank you supervisor once again a big thank you and a round of applause to our pd for the fine job they did with those anti-semitic and disgusting <laughs> paintings um geez I, I i had the occasion to stop by at Freedom Gardens on uh, Saturday off of Strawberry Road for their annual event that they have there. It was very nice. They, yeah. they uh, had a good uh, burger. Yes, yeah, it was Delicious good burger. food, great people. They had a nice little band playing, some, some uh, music going on, and the kids were having a good time. Really, really nice, and it's a great thing for the disabled folks that, that are, are there and, and are able to um, uh, participate in the community and participate in something like that. It's nice for them to get out on the great lawn, as I called it. Um, Granite Knolls, our adaptive playground, is almost done. We were hoping to have the grand opening on the 11th at 11. Unfortunately, I don't think Mother Nature is going to cooperate with us. Um, so we're going to move it to the 12th at 11. Okay, there's a lot of 11 and 12s going on here, but we're going to uh, move to have it on the 12th at 11 a.m. Um, I think you folks, if you can make it, take a ride up there. It's, it's beautiful. And it's phase one. Okay, there's another phase coming, and we've had a lot of help from not only um, uh, different groups and so forth, but our own town departments have lent a hand up there. We have uh, the water department, for one, who's running uh, irrigation to one little area there so that it's it, it will be less taxing on the parks department to have to water the plants that are going to go into the sensory garden and the ones that are going to be surrounding the adaptive, pay <clears throat> excuse me, adaptive playground. So that's, uh, that's June 12th at 11. <laughs> okay, and as for the 4th of July, try as I may, we could not get fireworks for the 4th of July. Okay? You just told me now, no. Huh? Oh, you, just, you just told me now that we can't get fireworks. We can't get them. Okay. We can get all the fireworks we want. The problem is there's no shooters available. Um, you know, due to COVID, the, uh, the, the, the work shortage, et cetera, Unfortunately, we can't get them. So we're going to be working with uh, to try and put on a program a little bit later. So stay tuned. That's all I got. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't get that to you before. I forgot. It's okay. No problem. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, the other thing for, for the 4th of July, uh, I do want to thank Paul Martin from the Historical Society. He's actually uh, organizing a reenactment of the reading of the Declaration of Independence oh, uh, right here at Town Hall. We will have our own George Washington lookalike and some colonial... Uh, leaders, uh, hopefully here, uh, and we'll be providing more information on that. So, um, trying to do a little bit something more on Fourth of July to remember what the date what the is all date about. Is, yeah. So, uh, uh, okay. so and we, I, I I don't do an impersonation, but I'll have a Sam Adams instead. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I'm going to turn it over to Councilman Ed Lackerman. All right, uh, a few more things coming up. It, it is actually a pretty busy weekend. Um, on uh, Friday, uh, Ju uh, June 10th. We have Relay for Life on the Veterans Memorial Field uh, in the evening. I believe that runs 6 to 11, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's a great way to get out and help support those that, have, uh, that are fighting cancer, that are, that are overcoming it, and also uh, in memory of those that, that we've lost from cancer. Uh, it'll be great when we have the day where it's you know just uh, celebrating those who overcame it because everyone mm -hmm. has. Um, then on uh, Sunday the 12th, in addition to now the uh, interactive playground, my brother Vinny is doing their, uh, their annual walkathon and art drive, once again at Veterans Memorial Field. Uh, and what they're, what they're doing this year, uh, in addition to the walk, they do a walk anywhere, but they, they have a physical location here. Uh, and um, they're also collecting artwork. So if anyone has artwork, what, so you know, my, what my brother Vinny does is they help veterans who get their shelter from the VA, which in reality is just f stark walls, nothing in it, no beds, no chairs, no table, nothing. 
So uh, Paula Miratello started uh, helping uh, veterans. Someone came to her at the, when she first started. She was actually, you know, oh, you're moving? Any furniture you don't want, I'll take that and hold it. And when a veteran needs it, she'd pass it on. Uh, they've gotten a, a, a little too big for that. They actually get hotels now when they are uh, remodeling. They get furniture from them. They do a, a, uh, a separate bed that they buy online uh, through donation money that they receive. And people could actually, I know my wife, instead of sending money, will order a bunch of stuff from Amazon and just send it right over to, to their thing. They have their wish list online. On Amazon uh, Smile, right? Uh, Amazon Smile, you do it, they get a percentage back. So there's really, you know, it's, they do some great work, but one of the things that she realized is, you know, furnishing the apartment is nice, but it's not a home, and the art helps bring that together and helps make it more of a home. So she's looking to help veterans upgrade. So if you have any paintings or prints that are, that, you know, you've changed out, uh, sitting up in the attic or down in the basement might be a great way to get rid of it. You could drop it off right there. Uh, they'll be set up at the American Legion post and right across the street from there at the field as well. So uh, just something you could do to, to help out if possible. What time is the walk? Uh, 11 a.m. I think it starts at 11. I have, I have to find out because my goddaughter actually does the Pledge of Allegiance for it. So, oh, and, and, and we'll be walking as well, Carol, myself, and Maxine. Um, you know, uh, also, we have our last uh, Sons of American Legion breakfast before our summer break, and then we resume in September. And it is on Father's Day, which, you know, as Sons of the American Legion, it is a fantastic way to pay that tribute to your father or grandfather who served, which is one of the, uh, one of the rec uh, rec uh, requirements. <laughs> of being there, sorry, a little tongue-tied today. Uh, you're, you do honor for your father or grandfather that served in any military uh, action during, uh, during well, from the uh, World War I up now. Uh, so we will be doing that. It's a $10 donation. The breakfast consists of two types of eggs, two types of pancakes, corned beef hash, bacon, sausage, Uncle. juice, coffee. Yeah, uh, hash brown, so it's it's a great little breakfast, a good way to come have a little camaraderie. Uh, you could just show up. It's uh, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. on Sunday the 19th. And I don't cook there. Yes. So that's a good thing. Yes, and it might be a bad thing that I do cook there. But it does. <laughs> um, and uh, the last thing I have, uh, uh, event-wise, the Lions concerts are getting ready to start. Uh, so uh, get yourself ready. The, uh, the schedule, uh, June 26th, we'll have Andrea and the Armenian Rug Riders. Uh, on July 10th, we have the Showtime Dance Band. On July 17th, the, I guess it goes with the, the band's little music. <laughs> um, on uh, July 17th, the Ray Vaughn's 50, uh, uh, 50s Radio Tribute Show. On eight, uh, August 7th, happy birthday to my wife, Carol. She'll be seeing Billy Joel with uh, Danny V's 52nd Street, tribute to Billy Joel. Uh, and then uh, August 21st, Tramps Like Us, Bruce Springsteen tribute. And uh, on August 28th, we end it with class action. But where all of our concerts start at 6 p.m., that one starts at 5 p.m. And we will have a military appreciation show featuring Alyssa Martin, Paul Martin's daughter, wonderful, wonderful singer. She does some great 50s, oh, yeah. 40s and 50s stuff. And that show starts at 5 p.m. And that will end our concert series. Ed, excuse me, with the concert series, do you, do you have the cards out yet? I, I, I do have, not. Okay. I, I'm hoping to have them by the end of the week, so they should be at uh, the Poolins do a tent for Relay for Life, so they should be there, hopefully. Great. great. By then. All set? Uh, yeah, and you know what? I just, I just did want to also, you know, uh, Steve and Lara Galliford, what, what great work they do do in the community. And, uh, you know, I just want to congratulate them because I believe they are also celebrating their 25th anniversary this year. Awesome. Uh, as, as being in business here in Yorktown. It's great. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, sir. And that's it for me. Councilman Esposito. I'll be brief. Uh, we have uh, quite a long agenda tonight. Um, I just wanted to give a special shout out to Alex Mandera. Uh, for the putting on the Veterans Parade. He's the head of the VFW. 
uh, right here in Yorktown, and he did a fantastic job. Um, the chamber did hold their Spring Fest or Summer Fest. What did they call it? Spring, uh, spring Fest. No, it was Summer Market and Car Show. Oh, that's right. Um, and um, it, and it was really good. They had they had over I think eighty cars there. It was uh, and they held it at uh, Railroad Park. A walk a, a spark, which is uh, let me get this right. Special program and resource connection. They're right here in Yorktown. Great organization. Uh, Kathleen Macias Torres is uh, the person that runs it, and they really help children with disabilities. Well, anyway, they had a uh, they do great work. They had a uh, steps to accept walk fundraiser. Um, right here at the gazebo, um, I was there, and uh, it was it was uh, it was a nice event. So I want to bring uh, kudos to them. And on the horizon, not too far from now, the Fireman's Carnival is back in town. So summer yeah. is back, um, and so I believe it starts on the twenty second. Um, so yep, it's Wednesday a Wednesday, twenty second. We're going to have the Fireman's Parade. It's a really great event. Really great uh, building in community <clears throat> spirit. I hope to see everybody there. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman? I guess I'll just go ahead and echo everything that they've said at this point. Um, I do want to thank the administration and the teachers that the year is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, please um, remember that we do have a lot, of, um, a lot of events for our children and our adults and our seniors in our Parks and Rec. And take a look and use them because we've actually had many children walk away and adults walk away very disappointed that we'd had to cancel different programs to to not enough applicants um we have a wonderful town camp and we have a wonderful although they are going to be renovating um stage camp that's here right here locally to support our family needs so i just wanted to remind everyone of that oh and happy pride month thank you very much okay let me just get my agenda back out here very good. So uh, our highway superintendent sends his best to everyone. It is paving season. It's his second favorite season of the year other than Christmas and the holidays. <laughs> uh, but we were out today up on uh, Summerson Road uh, on the north side of town, uh, and they have, started, uh, they have started paving. So uh, if you do see our workers out there, please yeah. slow down. Yeah, please. <laughs> and even after they leave, when you're on a nice smooth road, slow down. slow down again. Uh, we ask that for everyone's safety. Uh, and especially our workers, because they do a great job, uh, and we really appreciate their efforts. Uh, we are going to just uh, run through a couple proclamations. Uh, so I'm going to hand it back sure. over to of our course. councilwoman to read the first one for recognizing Gay Pride Month. Yep. Whereas the town of Yorktown recognizes the many contributions to our community, county, state, and nation by lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning LGBTQ individuals, which have included advancements in business medicine, law, education, music, sports, arts, and culture, and whereas members of the LGBTQ community come from all parts of our community, regardless of color, ethnicity, religion, economic status, or gender, and whereas June is recognized as Gay Pride Month because it marks the 53rd anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion, an event accepted as the single most important event leading to the fight of the LGBTQ community were made across the country. And on June 11th, a similar demonstration will be held to celebrate the LGBTQ members and continue our collective efforts to ensure equality, freedom, and rights of all are protected, preserved, and advanced. And now, therefore, be it resolved, the town of Yorktown recognizes and celebrates June as Gay Pride Month and... Be it further resolved, the town of Yorktown recommits itself to support and accept all members of our community, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or preference. And be it re further resolved that the town of Yorktown stands as a community of hope, generosity, and acceptance to everyone regardless of religion, race, national origin, ethnicity, culture, or orientation. We have a motion? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next, we have one for Relay for Life. So we'll turn it over to Councilman Diana. Thank you, Supervisor. Whereas the town of Yorktown is proud to have a strong partnership with the American Cancer Society Relay for Life, and whereas Relay for Life is the world's largest peer-to-peer -peer fundraising event dedicated to saving lives from cancer, 
And whereas Relay for Life is a movement of survivors, caregivers, volunteers, and neighbors who yearn for a cancer-free future, and whereas Relay for Life has been a part of the Yorktown community for the past 15 years with the help <clears throat> pardon me, and support great volunteers such as Jim and Denise Poulin, Monica Garrigan, uh, Christina Ianoco, Stephanie Ianoco, Jane McCarthy, Jean Scanlon, uh, Helen Brown, Debbie uh, Vallecchio, Donna D'Andrea, among many others. And whereas Relay for Life took a two-year hiatus due to COVID-19 pandemic, but continue to hold traditional events such as painting the town purple and its boot drive on Commerce Street. Now, there, <clears throat> now there, therefore, be it resolved that the town of Yorktown applauds the many volunteers who have made the Yorktown Relay for Life a successful community event over the past 15 years, and be it further resolved that the town of Yorktown acknowledges the many residents who are currently inflicted with the poisons of cancer, as well as the brave survivors who have overcome cancer diagnosis. And be it further resolved that the town of Yorktown also remembers those we have lost to cancer over the past two years and for the town board to pause in its deliberations for a moment of silence in their memory. And I, I was going to mention this uh, when we, after we did the pledge, but I think it's we all know someone who's been inflicted with cancer, someone who's lost a battle with cancer, someone who's battling cancer. Uh, the town of Yorktown is actually sponsoring a, a team this year for Relay for Life for our workforce. Uh, I know that uh, my wife's sponsoring a team. I'm sponsoring a team. Uh, I'm sponsoring a team this year uh, for Jackie Davis Baker. And Jackie's a Yorktown resident. Uh, Jackie is a retired Yonkers school teacher. Uh, and Jackie is, is, uh, had overcome cancer and unfortunately received a second diagnosis. And so she is battling with such courage uh, and drive uh, it's just such an inspiration to see but uh, i think it's important if we could just all bow our heads for a moment and remember those who have unfortunately lost uh, a battle with cancer thank you Amen. and last uh, oh, we have a motion Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And uh, Councilman Esposito, Race Amity Day. Whereas over the course of the last two years, the Yorktown Town Board has consistently spoken out and stood against all forms of hate, racism, and bigotry within our community, state, and nation. And whereas the Yorktown Town Board believes it is important to build strong community relationships with organizations that strive to promote greater understanding and counter hate. And whereas Race Amity of Northern Westchester and Putnam has a long history of uniting people by condemning acts of racial violence by building impactful relationships with the goal of advancing inclusiveness, equality, and justice through the community-focused communication, collaboration, and healing. And whereas Race Amity Day is meant to be a day to reflect and affirm the dignity brought by the diverse society of America, which includes racial, cultural, and religious backgrounds, Whereas, and whereas, the Yorktown Town Board recognizes that the social infections of hate and racism have and continue to exist in all communities across our nation, our nation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Yorktown Town Board acknowledges the continued efforts of race amity of Northern Westchester and Putnam within our community, and be it further resolved that the town of Yorktown continues to strive to be a community of acceptance and understanding for all its residents. And be it further resolved, the Yorktown Town Board, Board wholeheartedly rejects all forms of hatred, racism, oppression, religious or ethnic bias, discrimination, incitement of violence, and vandalism. I'd like to recognize Judith Stevens, who's here and a member of uh, uh, Race Amity of Northern Westchester and Putnam. They're celebrating uh, Race Amity Day this weekend over in Somers. And with that, uh, we'll take a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'd like to say I, I know someone that uh, has been dealing with race amnesty and, and their teachings and has been very, very impressed with the programming and 
uh, really feels that it's made an impact in his life, and it's it's a, a great uh, great thing. Awesome, it's great. Happy to hear that. Uh, next, we're going to have another presentation uh, from Myra Clark Siegel. Myra, Myra, you here? Yep, come on up. So I know that um, in, in light of recent events and events that have unfortunately continued to transpire throughout the country, throughout the state, and, and throughout our very own community, uh, we felt it was important to begin inviting people uh, who can shed some light and education to our community uh, about s topics such as racism and anti-Semitism. Uh, Myra's here uh, on behalf of the American Jewish Council. Committee. Committee. See, I, always, I always intertwine the two. It's alphabet soup. Yeah, it <laughs> really is. Um, uh, and so she's here to talk about uh, anti-Semitism, provide a briefing on anti-Semitism. Uh, she has a PowerPoint presentation, which I'm going to pop up on the screen. Uh, and I just think in light of what's transpired in recent weeks and days here in Yorktown, and I share with Myra uh, uh, this morning or this afternoon uh, about um, the great work by our police department. But it's also important that we're educating and we're using this moment as a, as a learning uh, moment for everyone in our community. And so we're, we're thrilled to have, have you here. We welcome you to the town of Yorktown. I'm going to get you up on the screen in two right, seconds. Thank you. And Supervisor Slater, if you can just tell me approximately how much time so that I make sure that I am sure. judicious uh, with everybody's time. And hi to everybody here. I feel badly that my back is. Can you you want to say uh, you want to say ten minutes, ten sure. fifteen minutes? Great. Is that okay. okay? We'll do ten minutes, and then we can do Q and A, and anything that we don't cover tonight, we can you can find me, and uh, we can continue the conversation. Thank you very much. So, as Supervisor Slater is pulling this up, I'll, I'll take a moment to introduce myself. Again, I feel badly that my back is to you. Um, please accept my apologies. My name is Myra Clark Siegel. I am the Regional Director for AJC, American Jewish Committee. Um, AJC is the oldest civil rights uh, Jewish organization in the country. We were founded in 1906. And the principles that we were founded upon in 1906 continue through our DNA every day, including today. Those principles include combating anti-Semitism, but also standing for pluralism and equality for everybody. So as I listen to and read through the resolutions that you all are championing this evening in the town council proceedings, these are very much in line with AJC's priorities. And one of the things that we are proudest of at AJC is, in fact, the relationships and the partnerships that we have built and established and nurture with partners in every faith, in every religion, in every background, every ethnicity. Uh, that is the Muslim Jewish uh, Advisory Council. That is the partnership with the Asian American Pacific Islander community. That is partnerships with the Latino and Latinx community. That is uh, partnerships uh, and formal partnership with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, this is really I think a reflection of AJC and what we do because while we as a community all do a pretty good job in times of crisis, it's when the waters are calm that this hard work really takes place. It is the day-to-day -day work that we all do that really is what brings our communities together in terms of celebrating the diversity of our community. And I really do use that term celebrating because I do believe that when our communities stand together, we really are that much stronger and that it's a multiplier effect. So I am here to, you, to speak with you this evening about the issue of anti-Semitism um, because we think back and we think about this horrific, horrific attack that took place in Buffalo just a few weeks ago that I think none of us can really get our heads around. Someone with a racist, hatred-filled screed drove three and a half hours with one purpose, and that was to kill as many people who looked different as possible. And as a parent, to think that children who were riding their bikes earlier that day or people who had been just going about their business doing grocery shopping were gunned down because of the color of their skin. And this is very similar to the kinds of hatred that the Jewish community has been facing. In fact, the screed that that person wrote was not only against the black community, but against the Jewish community, against new Americans, against immigrants, 
And this is what we're here to speak about tonight. And I'm here to speak to you very specifically about anti-Semitism. But the reason that this is so important is because at AJC, we believe that when one community is under threat, every community is under threat. And unfortunately, it is the Jewish community historically that is first in the line of attack and fire. So I want to share with you all a few things. And, and if you'll indulge me, I'm going to ask you all a few very quick questions. Um, and everybody here who's joining us can also answer uh, this information. Have you ever, over the course of the past 12 months, avoided attending an event or a place because of fear for your safety and security because of your religion? Yes, no, sometimes, maybe? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> Except for COVID. Fair yeah. enough. But not because <clears throat> of your religion. Right. Have you ever been the victim of an attack because of your religion? Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. Okay, yes. Have you ever avoided posting something on social media because you were afraid that your religion would identify you as differently and, and garner hatred? Yes. No. Smartest. Don't yeah, use social media. Don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> so these are some of the questions that we asked at AJC um, after the horrific attack in 2018 on the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Um, I want to take a little bit of a step back, though, and I'm going to peel the curtain back on this survey and some subsequent surveys that we did at AJC, because I think that it's first important, and we can go to the next slide, next slide. about um, understanding what the Jewish community is. Because unlike a race, the Jewish community are a people. Yes, the religion is Judaism. That is the common denominator with everyone who is Jewish. But if you look at these examples and these pictures, you will see that there is a significant amount of diversity. Hmm. You have people who are Asian. You have people who are black. You have people who are Moroccan, Arab. Uh, you have people who um, are from every background. To look at me, you would not know that I am a Latina Jew. And that is one of the strengths of our community, is that the Jewish community is as diverse as the globe. And the reason that I am sharing this is to think of Jews, it is not just a religion. There are also people who are Jewish, who are agnostic, who are atheist, but who are still Jewish. And people attack Jews no matter whether you are practicing or not. And worldwide, the Jewish community is a tiny community. There are about 2% of the American population, 2% of the American population is Jewish. Worldwide, that is 0.2%. The Jewish population before the Holocaust was approximately 16 and a half million people. 75 years later, we still have not reached pre-Holocaust levels. It just puts it in a little bit of context for you. Hmm. And yet, and we'll talk about this as, as we go into some of this information, the Jewish community in the United States, and quite frankly globally, is the number one religion that is attacked with hate crimes for religious reasons. The black community is the number one racially attacked community with approximately 60% of hate crimes as uh, evidenced by FBI statistics that the FBI collects um, from law enforcement annually in communities across the country. So the black community is the unwilling, unwitting number one attack uh, community when it comes to racial hate crimes, and the Jewish community is the number one community for religiously based hate crimes. And when you think about those numbers again, that the Jewish community is 2% of the American population, it really shows you the disproportionality uh, of these attacks. And certainly nobody wants this. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit, and we'll skip through some you just of tell these. me when they go I'll to the tell next you where slide. To go. Yep. So what happened after 2018 at the Tree of Life attack in Pittsburgh is this was a bit of a wake-up call for the American Jewish community. Thankfully, even despite uh, attacks that have actually quite hap that have happened since revolutionary times uh, on the Jewish community and discrimination that the Jewish community has faced here in the United States, at the same time, the United St States has been the safest haven for the Jewish community anywhere in the world, any time in history. 
And yet, the Tree of Life attack made everybody sit up and take notice. And so we at AJC wanted to assess whether that was a one-off or whether it was actually a sign of something deeper. So we undertook the largest survey of the Jewish community done in this country. And some of what we found was surprising. Some of it was not for those of us who deal with these issues. Subsequently, the next year, we conducted that survey again, so we had the baseline data that we used, and then we had a comparison with the general population. And again, we did this last year in 2021, in October of 2021. And I want to share with you some of the findings and why we're here to talk about anti-Semitism tonight. So I'm going to share three key takeaways with you from uh, the, um, the survey. One, American Jews are concerned and they are changing their behaviors. If you think about some of the questions that I asked you when we began, um, American Jews are terrified. And we need only think about Charlottesville, where people were chanting in the streets, Jews will not replace us. We need only think about Poway, Poway, Colleyville, Muncie, New York City, Los Angeles, and quite frankly, not to that level, thankfully, but the racist graffiti that we found here in Yorktown a few weeks ago are another example of the kind of ha baseless hatred against the Jewish community. So American Jews are terrified and they are changing their behaviors. Two, there is a response and several responses that we can take together. And that's something that we're going to be speaking about this evening. And that is adopting a working definition of anti-Semitism. Why is this important? Because that which we can measure, that which we can define rather, we can, we can measure, that which we can measure, we can address. That's why the information that the FBI uh, collects from, from law enforcement across this country is so incredibly important. But again, to only collect it and not have that definition about what anti-Semitism is, is only half of the package. And thirdly, anti-Semitism is cre increasing in this country, but the American Jewish community feels that it is not being heard. So, in the interest of time, I want to skip ahead to a few other slides. This is, if you'll hit uh, uh, Supervisor Slater, the button again, there is a definition. It is called the IRA, I say it, IRA for short, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or IRA, Working Definition of Anti-Semitism. This was forged over a number of years together by experts on the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, global experts. AJC was part of this um, definition development. And while there is no perfect definition, these were the words that were crafted as the best way to try to address what is hatred towards Jews. So the short version of it is anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Now, why is this important? Again, because if we adopt this, then we have a tool, we have a working definition that we can use. And what I'd like to do is just fast forward by a few slides and talk about some of the findings of that survey. We can keep going. Again, this reflects that Jews are two in every 100 Americans, but if you look at the hate crimes in 2020 alone, and by the way, 2021 was even higher in terms of hate crimes against the Jewish community. In 2021, there was a 365% increase in hate crimes against the Jewish community over 2020. In fact, in New York City, there was a 300% increase in the month of February this year alone. 300% increase on attacks on Jews in New York City in the month of February 2022 alone. And it's often when people look Jewish, outwardly facing, it might be their clothing, it might be a representation of a, a yarmulke or a kippah, or it could be a Star of David that somebody wears, or even a t-shirt in Hebrew. But as we saw even last year, People who may look Jewish but are not Jewish have been attacked simply because somebody thinks that they might Jew be Jewish. And if we can go on to the next slide. Here are a few ways that anti-Semitism is manifest. This is one of the ways, Holocaust denial or Holocaust uh, misappropriation. And we have three other things on here, if you'll just hit the button yep, four times. Hatred towards Jews, stereotypes and scapegoating, 
Holocaust denial and Holocaust comparisons. We've seen that very frequently in terms of COVID, where people who do not want to get vaccinated or people who don't want to wear masks will wear a yellow star, as, as was done, uh, that Jews had to wear during the Holocaust. That's a misappropriation of the Holocaust, and it's sick. Um, and inappropriately invoking Israel. So the state of Israel, uh, a democracy like any other country, um, not perfect like any other democracy, but often people are attacked and meant to represent uh, the country of Israel. And um, these are some other areas. And we'll go on. These are a few examples. Now, anti-Semitism actually has a unique aspect to it in terms of the hatred and racism. These are real. These are recent. These are from this year. Anti-Semitism both punches down and it pushes up. And what do I mean by that? Jews are attacked for being powerful, but Jews are also considered vermin. And this has been since time immemorial. In fact, anti-Semitism is called the oldest hatred because it is a 3,000-year-old hatred. If you think about deicide that was uh, espoused by the Catholic Church, that was only rebutted officially in 1965. Hmm. So think about unfortunate teachings in the name of religion against another people when we are all brothers and sisters. If we go on, this is some of the findings. So one in four American Jews has been the target of anti-Semitism over the past year. And we'll continue. 41% of Americans have witnessed an anti-Semitic incident in person online or against a Jewish institution over the past 12 months. So let me give you an example. I came in this evening. There was no magnometer. There was no security perimeter. The excellent law enforcement officer saw me but didn't check my ID. I didn't have to put my bag to be checked on a baggage uh, imaging the way you would in an airport. Go to any synagogue in this country or abroad, and you will have to go through a security perimeter the likes of which you will not encounter except at an international airport. There are security perimeters where a guard might greet you, and if you seem that you're innocuous, they will let you into the next piece. But that means there's going to be another guard there. That means there's going to be a locked door there. You cannot come in. That means you will go through typically a magnometer. That means you will often have your bags checked. Sometimes you have to give your name and your ID information in advance before you go into a synagogue. Now think about this. We're talking about a house of worship. We're talking about people being able to go in to worship, to have some spiritual or communal moments together, and you have to go through this kind of security perimeter. And I'll give you another example. I was driving to pick up my son from school, and I passed by a church. And there was a sign outside that said, our doors are open, come on in, all are welcome. And I thought to myself, how devastating that you would never be able to see that these days in front of a synagogue because of those security threats, simply because people are Jews and being hated for being Jews. So we'll go to the next slide. As I mentioned, we did su two subsequent surveys of the general public to see if there were discrepancies or correlations between the American Jewish perception and general society. And what you see is 9 in 10 American Jews think that, that anti-Semitism is a problem today, but only 6 in 10 of the general public see that. You have a 30% discrepancy here in the United States of America in 2022. This is not Europe. This is not 1933, 1938, 1942. This is the United States in 2022. And the more troubling one is the second area which is that fully one quarter of Americans think that anti-Semitism is not a problem in the country today. <coughs> so we'll keep going. I'm mindful of time. No, keep going, please. Um, and again, American Jews believe that anti-Semitism has increased over the past five years. But in fact, you have a decent number of the population that has said that it has either stayed the same or actually decreased. And again, think back to Poway, Charlottesville,
the January 6th attack on the Capitol where people wore sweatshirts that said 6MWNE. Do you all know what that stands for? Six million was not enough. And Camp Auschwitz. Those were sweatshirts that people were wearing. A week after one of the attacks, people were marching in Florida with neo-Nazi flags and salutes. This is what the American Jewish community is facing today. Let's keep going. And here, where I asked you all the question at the beginning about whether you may have changed some of the things that you do in terms of your behaviors, this is what the American Jewish community is feeling. Nearly four in 10 have changed at least one, if not more, of these behaviors. So they've avoided going to certain events or certain locations out of fear for their safety or well-being. They may not wear a religious symbol or clothing that may outwardly portray them as being Jewish. And fully a quarter have refrained from posting Jewish-related content that would identify them on social media as, as being Jewish. I will tell you that my own son, who is not shy at all, and is very proudly Jewish. He's 15 years old. He's completing ninth grade. Came up to me last year and said, why are there memes on my social media that says Hitler was right? Mm. How do you look your own child in the face and say, because there are some bad people out there? Right. That's exactly what he said. But that's what I said. That's and exactly he said, said, to his credit, and I'm not taking credit for this, um, I should, but I'll say it's, it's because he's a really strong character, said, it's okay, I reported them. That's what we need to be doing, mm-hmm. is being vigilant and monitoring and standing up. But that same meme was reported, was, was posted and reposted 15,000 times in one week in the spring of last year. 15,000 times, and that's what we've been able to track. So we'll go to the next slide. And this goes to social media. So you'll see here larger Facebook's icon, Mm -hmm. and you'll see the TikTok is smallest, because we asked a question about social media. Now, we did this survey of adults, of course. So had we asked people under the age of 18 these very questions, TikTok would have been number one. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and I will say Facebook has worked with AJC. We've reached out to all the major social media platforms to work with them. Facebook has credited AJC as one of two uh, global organizations that it has partnered with and worked with to help bring their attention to the issue of Holocaust denial specifically. There is still an incredibly long way to go mm-hmm. in terms of social media, um, but this is where so many people are encountering hatred. And we'll go on. Again, I mentioned the FBI hate crimes. We looked at these because we wanted to make sure that the information that we were finding wasn't an anomaly, and we wanted to ensure whether it corroborated with federal statistics, and that's what we found. And we'll go on. Sorry. Nope, that's on me. (laughs) And then this is very interesting because we all want to think not in my house. But the reality is that we say at AJC, we need to be swivel-headed when it comes to anti-Semitism. It is on the far left, Mm -hmm. it is on the extreme right, and it is from religious extremists. And anyone who is affiliated with any one political party needs to look within their own political party because it is there. It is absolutely there, and one need only look at some of the social media posts that unfortunately members of Congress have posted Mm -hmm. themselves Mm -hmm. or stated on the House floor Um, to understand just how prevalent this is. And we'll continue. Finally, one of the questions that I, or things that I mentioned, is how the Jewish community feels that it is not being heard. So the Jewish community, if you look at it, 46% feels that anti-Semitism is not being taken as seriously as other kinds of racism and hatred. And this is something that we need to address together as upstanding citizens. So what we're asking you all to do is to speak out, to be upstanders. That's all of us. That is not just for our elected officials. Um, You all have the power of the pen and of the gavel to be able to do this, and we look to you for your partnership. But it's for every citizen to stand up together 
and to stand in partnership with, with one another and to become educated about these issues. We at AJC have developed resources and tools. We have something called Translate Hate. I'm happy to, we, I have um, the symbol up here, and if you go to AJC.org and you enter Translate Hate in the search bar, it is a primer, it's a visual primer that takes many of the contemporary um, tropes, anti-Semitic tropes, and explains them so that people understand. So that when there was a government official from Louisville, Kentucky recently, who stood up in a town council meeting like this and was talking about negotiating a contract and said, don't worry, I Jewed him down, and did not realize it was not malicious in the way he said it. He didn't realize the trope that he was using. And when he was called out on it immediately, he could have taken the appropriate road, which was to say, oh my gosh, what a learning moment for me. I'm so sorry. I've learned now. I'm not going to do this anymore. But he tried to dig out of the hole. We have an opportunity to be upstanders together and to take action together. So the Translate Hate is a great resource for everybody, whether it's for schools, whether for government officials, for law enforcement, and again, it's online, and we're happy to be resources and partners. And again, then there's the opportunity to have um, measures that stand up with the Jewish community together. And one of those is the IRA working definition, and we would encourage you all to uh, adopt the IRA working definition. And the last thing that I will say is in partnership with the U.S. Conference of Mayors, we had a statement um, last year, the uh, Mayors United Against Anti-Semitism. And I want to thank you, Supervisor Slater, on behalf of Yorktown for signing on to that statement. That's a powerful statement. And adopting the IRA working definition will be another powerful tool in your arsenal to fight racism and hatred. So I want to thank you all for the opportunity and the time. And again, I'm here in partnership, and all of us at AJC are here as a resource for you all. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great presentation. Yeah, really good. You got, well, you can't you can't go anywhere yet. You got you got a bunch of questions. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, got, I I have to say I, I'm so very proud of this community for the work that has been done here to get away from that. Mm -hmm. I'm equally as proud of our own councilman here, Ed Lachterman, who has has spearheaded the Holocaust Remembrance Program mm -hmm. on a yearly basis, um, and. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. I'll probably say it another hundred times. You don't know what those folks have gone through until you talk with one. You, when you see the tattoos on the arms, when you, um, uh, you, you can read it. You can watch videos about it. You can, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's very riveting once you start talking to these folks to see the, the strife that they've gone through. It, it's it's amazing that they can can still pull off a conversation and talk about it rationally for the atrocities they've seen. And I, Ed, my, my hat's off to you for putting that on, uh, along with uh, uh, past supervisor Michael Grace, who who uh, uh, helped him along. His mother was actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, kinder uh, in a mm -hmm. in a kinder transport. So um, that that was that was uh, several years ago. But um, thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we've been doing a Yom HaShoah event. I don't know if you've been to any of them. And, uh, and it is a, a, a great educational tool. And mm -hmm. even like one of our local historians, Paul Martin, who's the uh, president of our historical society, uh, for our last survivor, he drove down and picked her up mm. and, and drove her up. And then he and I both drove her down. And just here's someone who's like an avid, avid World War II historian, and he learned so much from her presentation, from the conversation both ways, uh, and that was just, you know, amazing. But, you know, I don't think, as you said, people realize exactly how we were attacked as Jews. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I answered no to changing because I will never change. I, you know, I don't believe in terrorism. I don't believe that, that you, that you, that you uh, change your life because of terrorism, I should say. So, you know, but growing up, I dealt with a lot of that. I remember even going into a church. My wife and her family are Catholic. 
and I went into a church and I heard someone make a comment who knew I was Jewish and I I turned around and addressed it I said well actually I'm here with my mother-in-law because she's here for an event and she happens to be Catholic and you know it was almost the the, the comment was like well you're just here for for brownie points I guess and uh, I've been told by some of the priests I go into the church more than a lot of Catholics just because I go with my mother-in-law and my wife. Uh, and, uh, you know, just like, and you, you mentioned something about, um, about what's happened in the past. And uh, my grandmother came from a very small village in the Ukraine. And she left there uh, right after the Russian Revolution but uh, the Russian Revolution, I think about 900 of the Jews were killed there. And then afterwards, they were living. And no, some, 900? 900 were killed during the Russian Revolution at, from her village. Oh, from her village. From her okay. village. Okay. Uh, and I think they had a population of about 15,000 at that time. A few more moved away between World War I and the start of World War II. But when the Nazis advanced into the Ukraine, they murdered every Jew in the village. And to this day, there are no Jews in that right. village. Death by bullets is what it was called. Yep. And, you know, I, it, and like you said, just for a religious practice. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I just don't think a lot of people understand it. It's something that, uh, that they need to. And, and you know, I, and you also spoke about the tropes, you know, like, uh, you know, using, using certain words or just you know, brutal. I, uh, you know, I saw something posted on Facebook, which, which I, I was appalled at, and um, you know, where someone's using the term extermination, not realizing, I guess, or not caring. So there, there have been, you know, th there's a lot to go educationally, um, and and uh, I, I even learned a lot. A friend of mine is a rabbi, Rigoberto Emanuel Vinyas. He's Cuban. <laughs> you don't meet many Cuban rabbis. I'm Cuban. Okay. <laughs> so, so not you're, a rabbi yet. Not a rabbi yet. <laughs> and you know, what, he and I have had many conversations, and and his, and his dad, who's moved to the states now since as well, and we spoke about that. And it's like, you know, how did you get by? It's like we didn't advertise. Basically, we couldn't live our lives. We couldn't do what we wanted to. But the Sephardis, you know sort of assimilate a lot better into their community uh, and and you know they were able to get by so it's uh, you know it's frightening that we're still experiencing it and still seeing it here you know well <clears throat> how many thousands of years later but thank you for the work you do thank you thank you councilman for for your work yeah right. I um, think Esposito? I think it starts with using uh, you know bringing in an awareness the tropes are, are, are really, I think, where it begins. And people don't realize, uh, you know, I, I was born in Italy and, uh, you know, uh, we're all mafia. I mean, I, it, the term was actually used in, uh, in a meeting here by, by somebody at Courtesy of the Floor last year. I heard it. It's very derogatory to Italian Americans. People think it's romanticized. It's not. Um, but the person didn't, probably didn't realize it. But I think that's where it begins, especially with the Jewish community. Um, people um, say things offhandedly, and they may not actually mean it. Some people do, unfortunately. Um, you know, but I think, I think raising that level of awareness, um, it, it starts, I think, that's a good starting point. But there's a lot of work that has to be done, and, and I commend you for being here. I commend you for doing what you're doing. I'm sure it takes up a lot of your time, and you seem very passionate about it. So I appreciate it. And, you know, what, you're, what you say about the Jewish community extends to pretty much any and all other communities of race, creed, or color, sexual orientation, mm -hmm. all of it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I do have a question. Sure. Um, I'm a mental health coach and I do a lot of somatic work. And one of the things that I'm taught is to combat the tropes by sitting in it so that we don't shame them, but we let them actually see and understand what they've done so that they can't just be like, I'm sorry, or like you use the example of going backwards. So are there any tools that AGC, AJC uses to allow someone to have that reflection to understand like 
that maybe they thought it was funny, but to really understand what they were saying and why it's not funny, and maybe to dig a little deeper and see what's happening within them or what may have happened in their homes. And I mean, as an adult, I like to think the way that I speak, my children mirror it. So it's, I'm very careful on them understanding other people's experiences and them understanding things that they have uncertainties about, to understand what kind of differences they may have and to what it must be like to be them, but never to compare mm -hmm. themselves to someone else. So I'm just curious to know if you had any tools that you guys use or, or train so that it's not just learning the vocabulary and it's not just supporting a statement and it's not just saying I am and please raise awareness, but it's actually slowing down, which I think all of America needs to do, and really seeing what's in front of you and holding space for it. So I don't know um, if you have any tools you might want to share with the community. So we are an advocacy organization, and so uh, you know what we really work on is advocacy issues. Um, but that being said, we call things out when they need to be called mm -hmm. out. We don't give somebody a pass. Um, I will tell you that this morning I was briefing journalists from a particular news organization because there was an issue a few months ago um, where a cartoon was printed, editorial cartoon was printed in the newspaper, and it was, had pretty significant anti-Semitic overturn, overturns in it. And we called them out on it discreetly, reached out. Sometimes you have to reach out discreetly and have a conversation with somebody, and sometimes you have to do it publicly. Um, we reached out and said, not sure if you all are aware, but this is deeply upsetting to the Jewish community. Um, and we have had a series of briefings that we've had with the journalists so that they understand. And we met with the editorial board, and they immediately, to their credit, took ownership of this. They didn't shy away from it. Mm. They didn't try to hide behind it, make it as they didn't try to say, oh, this was on deadline and it just slipped through. They owned it, to their credit. But they owned it because we also met them in the space that they were in. And there's a little bit of a delicate Dance. approach yes. that you have to do because you want to meet somebody in that space. Absolutely, because once you start doing the blame shame game, right. you lose you exactly. lose their attention. The accountability exactly. is out the window. But yeah. there are also moments where you have to call it out very publicly, and and we do that too. And mm -hmm. as a fiercely nonpartisan organization, um, and and I. And with AJC for as many years as I have been, for 13 years now, um, I am proud of the fact that we are nonpartisan because I think that, mm -hmm. that we all need to work together. Mm -hmm. And this issue is bigger than any one party or, yeah. or individual. So sometimes we will approach people in the space that they're in, um, always in partnership, always in a friendly manner. But sometimes we'll also just be blunt and call somebody mm -hmm. out in a very public way, particularly if they're an official, because they have a responsibility as an official or as lead by an a public person mm -hmm. um, to do that. So I hope that's a little bit helpful, and I think Translate Hate can be really helpful, and yep. it can be incorporated and utilized in our homes, in our communities, and teaching ourselves and our children and our colleagues in our workplaces. There are microaggressions. There are major aggressions and to really address them as they take place. And um, I guess the last thing I'll say is the Thursday before Thanksgiving, you're all invited to our 21st Thanksgiving diversity breakfast that oh, we host. That. Um, hundreds of people in our community joined together. We began this at AJC Westchester Fairfield right after 9-11, in fact, when members of the Muslim community and, and Sikh community were being attacked as scapegoats for what took place in 9-11. Mm -hmm. And we did this to stand in solidarity mm -hmm. together. Yeah, and this is all of our communities coming together and celebrating the diversity of our communities. So we will share that information with you all and hope that you'll join us for that as great. well. But that's one example of how we actually use our voices, I think, collectively to stand together and celebrate each other. That'd be great. Thank you, Myra. Myra, do you have yeah. a card? I do. Definitely. Before you go get the card, just a couple of things on my end. Uh, so uh, we work with Alliance for Safe Kids uh, to do a lot in our community. Mm -hmm. um, they have a great dashboard where we put a lot of our online resources, yeah. both for kids but also for their parents. Mm -hmm. uh, so Translate Hate is going to go right there immediately. Uh, I can tell you that. I think we're also we, – I'd like to also work with our team to find a place to put it on the town's website as well to help educate 
on, on that end as well. Absolutely. I think it's important for us to, to, to do that as well. Wait, say that last part again. I lost what you said. So we can put it on the town's website. As oh, well. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You talked a lot about learning moments. Mm -hmm. And our community has been impacted by this directly in the last week, week and a half, two weeks. So from your standpoint, how do we turn this into a learning moment to educate not just those who uh, committed these acts, but our community as a whole? What would, you, what would your advice be for us to take this opportunity as a learning moment? And what would you advise us to teach other than having you come and, and doing this great presentation, which was fantastic? Okay. But I think, we have to, I think from a community standpoint, it's clear that we want to get to the next level mm -hmm. of understanding and acknowledgement. And listen, the, one, and I, uh, the other point I want to get to is about your civility to public discourse. But it's very clear, and as you, as you said, as a nonpartisan organization, your, your stats showed it, no one is innocent here. Right. No one political party is innocent. So how do we take this moment and turn it into a community moment and turn it into a learning moment for our community? It's a great question. I'm sure that you all have ideas about what you want to do. But Everyone's I would got shine a lot a of bright ideas. Light on it. I would shine a bright light on it. Mm -hmm. Don't hide it. Mm -hmm. Shine a light on it. Use it as that teaching moment. Have, um, you can involve students where there is, I wouldn't call it a contest because you don't want to take something that is hate-filled and turn it into a contest. But you could have essays written by students in school mm -hmm. about what this meant for them to hear that this was happening in Yorktown. Um, what that feels like, it, what they would feel like if something about them or their community was put in this hateful way, mm -hmm. graffitied in a hateful way. I think that you can use it to educate the educators mm -hmm. because that is so important so that they can have conversations with their students. Um, there's an opportunity, I think, for interfaith dialogue. Mm -hmm. Having a roundtable on hmm. racism and that? hatred with faith leaders and government officials. Because I think that when we pull down the silos and we bring people together for these conversations, we can amplify those teaching moments that much more. Um, Myra, there was a human library done once. And um, I do it in a lot of my DEI programs where you actually sit and you sit with someone else mm -hmm. and, they, and they tell you their story. Right. And the connection that when you walk away is so much more impactful, although there are some fantastic books. Right. It's so much more impactful. And I think that maybe having a somewhat of a blog or if AG, AJC is doing something or there's another not-for-profit shedding light on awareness mm -hmm. and or just highlighting something that was done county-wise yeah. or whatnot, mm -hmm. bringing some love towards it, keeping somebody in our prayers. Like The movements start small, but they start in everyone's home. I agree. They start in everyone's home. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's most important. And I do love, I don't know how to do it, <laughs> but I did love the human library because um, I mean, my hopes is to keep bringing in speakers to tell their story and their perspectives, whether it's small or large or on scales of, you know, all different verses of pain. But um, the human library definitely was impactful because first you got to meet someone and you got to look at someone in their face and like hear about their life experience, their struggle. Right. And you can do that in three minutes. Exactly. We've done that exercise even with our board, you know, and, and you bring people together and you're paired off and you have a three-minute conversation and then the other person speaks and you build a bond. It's right. amazing what can happen in those few minutes together. And then the concept of other disappears. Yeah, I was just right. going to say, and with the interfaith, if what she's saying, they can all bring their fears. Like one day it could be just bring your fears or bring right. your, you know, bring your concerns or bring your wishes. And that group of children or teenagers or adults can actually brainstorm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if you have this alliance or in this container that you create, then the conversations can actually be productive. Right, exactly. So. And what about restoring uh, civil public discourse? Because <laughs> well, that's, that's, I don't think we have enough time it's, for exactly. that. It's, it's <laughs> one, of the, one of your points, and it's something I think that needs to be discussed. Right. And we can, I'm more than happy to have you come back, and we can do a whole session just on yeah. that point. But as we saw in your statistics, no one is innocent. Right. And when, unfortunately, these things happen, people get angry. Well, it's easy to point fingers, right? And people then. get angry. And listen, I was angry. Of course. But anger doesn't always solve the problem. No. Right. 
you need to be able to really control your emotions to have productive conversations, mm -hmm. even with people you may not philosophically or politically agree with. So what are your thoughts on that point that you have on speaking out and being an ally? So I think that the same approach in terms of bringing community leaders together is a very powerful one for civil discourse. Faith leaders, for example, are practiced in mm -hmm. that area. They are educated in that area, and they practice it every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think bringing people together from the faith community can be very powerful. Teachers are extremely powerful in this area as well. Um, God knows especially over the past few years, what teachers have faced um, in terms of trying to teach and educate students through COVID. Um, I think bringing them together for a round table and hearing from them about how to do this. And, and even as something as innocuous as a student council uh, debate in high school or in middle school, how do you teach civility at that level? Because right. the people right. who are running for those offices when they're in school are going to continue to run for office as they get older. Having candidate fora for different candidates and making sure that they're respectful. I mean, mm -hmm. this is how we we teach others. It's it's by the actions that we do. Right. I just want to just make something clear. I guess this is more my opinion. In my in my experience. There's allyship and then there's fake allyship. Right. Okay. And it's really important giving people the right resources and tools so that they can actually find that sense of like self forgiveness. If they may have some of it within themselves, mm -hmm. be accountable for how they behave, like understand love. Remember that we're all gifts of God of any, whoever your God is and start from there. One of the things that I always fear and why I love the forum of bringing mm -hmm. people together is that there's a lot of fake allyship, right. which also leads to more hate because all it does is drive drama. Right, right. And that gives a sense of power and sh using power and hate is to get, right. So I, I see it on your face already. Together has been my biggest conflict of like how many people are coming to speak out and it's like more about the power and not really the allyship. So I'm really, I think from what my takeaway is, and I hope that we can continue discussing this, but creating those either with the interfaith or just with our town and the community, creating those discussion yeah. forums and having a sign-up genius where people can come and mm -hmm. creating an alliance, that's where it's going to start for me because I do believe that there's this sense of publicity and celebrity kind of highlights that happen around, and there are people that are suffering behind there, getting dragged into the mix, and I don't want to see that happen to the entire community. Right, exactly. Right. Well, Myra, I really can't thank you enough for, thank you, Myra. for being thank here, you for sharing this. Before yeah. you leave the podium... We do have a resolution, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Councilman Lachterman, uh, but this is the exact resolution that you encouraged us mm -hmm. to adopt, and with you at the podium, I'd like us to take those steps. And I will say this is almost as long as my half Torah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go head to head and see who had a longer one. <laughs> Three and a half pages. August 26th uh, was, my, it was like crazy. We might have had the same one. Mine was <laughs> September 2nd. <laughs> Probably then. Um. If, I, if I can just note one thing, uh, Councilman, before you introduce this. This working definition has been adopted by 37 countries uh, to date, by over 850 <coughs> non-governmental organizations, by universities and colleges, and um, including European sports teams, mm. so, uh, and by municipalities here across the United States as well. So um, if you all decide to adopt it, you will be in excellent leadership and company. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Um, approve the anti-Semitism uh, policy. Whereas, whereas anti-Semitism, including harassment on the basis of actual or perceived Jewish origin, ancestry, ethnicity, identity, affiliation, or faith, is an evil scourge on civilized societies throughout the world that must be identified and categorically rejected by all responsible individuals as well as private and public entities, yet remains a persistent, pers pervasive, and disturbing problem in American society. And whereas notwithstanding that the town of Yorktown has a long history of categorically rejecting discrimination in all of its forms, 
Jews continue to be a targeted minority in the United States and are consistently the most likely of all religious groups to be victimized by incidents of hate, and such incidents are increasing at alarming rate. And whereas the deadliest attack against the American Jewish community took place on October 27, 2018, at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, killing 11 worshipers and injuring several more, and whereas the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, by uh, consensus vote of its members, states, adopted a working definition of anti-Semitism in May 2016, which has become the internationally recognized authoritative definition for use by government and international organizations. And whereas the non-legally binding definition reads in full, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed towards Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property towards Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. And whereas, as an accompaniment in the, uh, to the definition to guide H IHRA in its work, the following examples may serve as illustrations. <clears throat> Manifestations might include the targeting of the State of Israel conceived as a Jewish collectivity. However, criticism of Israel similar to, the le to that leveled against any other country cannot be regarded as, as anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism frequently charges Jews with conspiring to harm humanity, and it is often used to blame Jews for why things go wrong. It is expressed in speech writing, visual forms, and action, and employs sinister stereotypes and negative character traits. Contemporary examples of anti-Semitism in public life, the media, schools, the workplace, and in the religious sphere could, taking into account the overall context, include, but are not limited to, calling for aiding or justifying the killing or harming of Jews in the name of radical ideology or an extremist view of religion making mendacious, dehumanizing, demonizing, or stereotypical allegations about Jews as such uh, or the power of Jews as collective, such as especially but not exclusively the myth about a world Jewish conspiracy or of Jews controlling the media, economy, government, or other social uh, societal institutions. Accusing Jews as a people of being responsible for real or imagined wrongdoings committed by a single Jewish person or group or even for acts committed by non-Jews, denying the fact, scope, mechanism, i.e. gas chambers, or intentionally uh, of the genocide of the Jewish people at the hands of National Socialist Germany and its supporters and accomplices during World War II, the Holocaust, accusing the Jews as a people or Israel as a state of inventing or exaggerating the Holocaust, accusing Jewish citizens of being more loyal to Israel or to the alleged priorities of Jews worldwide than the interests of their own nations, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, e.g. by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor, applying double standards for requiring of its behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation, using the symbols an image associated with classic anti-Semitism, uh, e.g. claiming uh, claims of Jews killing Jesus or blood libel to characterize Israel or Israelis, drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis, holding Jews collectively responsible for actions of the State of Israel, and whereas further guidance within the definition section sets forth that anti-Semitic acts are criminal, when they are defined by law, for example, denial of Holocaust or distribution of anti-Semitic materials in some countries. <coughs> Criminal acts are ant anti-Semitic when the targets of attacks, whether they are people or property, such as buildings, schools, places of worship, and cemeteries, are selected because they are or are perceived to be Jewish or linked to Jews. Anti-Semitism discrimination is the denial 
of Jews, of opportunities or services available to others, and it is illegal in many countries. And whereas the IHRA working definition has proved to be an essential tool used to determine contemporary manifestations of anti-Semitism, and whereas it is in the public interest for the town of Yorktown to join numerous municipalities across the United States and over 30 governments intentionally and up oh, sorry thank you internationally can't wear my glasses right now <laughs> um, internationally and in adopting the IHRA's definition of anti-semitism and attendant illustrative examples in order to provide a definitive message for the public expressly identifying those acts which constitute anti-semitism and are as such deserving of categorical re re rebuke and to aid the town's government in cooperating with recognized organizations which combat anti-Semitism and available procedures for reporting acts of anti-Semitism which have occurred or may occur in the town of Yorktown or elsewhere. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the town board of the town of Yorktown that the May 26, 2016 International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IHRA, working definition of anti-Semitism, including attendant illustrative examples as fully set forth here and above be and hereby is adopted by the town board as an official declaration of policy for your town and be it further resolved that it shall be policy of the town's government to utilize the said working definition of anti-semitism and attendant illustrative examples in a continuing endeavor to cooperate with recognized organizations in educating residents about identifying acts of anti-Semitism and available procedures for reporting acts of anti-Semitism which have occurred or may occur in the town of Yorktown. Motion. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank Myra, you. thank you. Thank you, Myra. Thank you, thank you, Myra. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. And Myra, don't forget to leave some cards. You know, what we'll do is we're going to take a two-minute uh, recess, and we'll be and we'll be right, right back. back to business.
One. Okay, thank you everyone for your patience. I'm going to welcome our Poet Laureate, John McMullen, to the podium. Just a follow-up there. In, in the last year, we had a congressperson talk about the Jewish laser beams from the sky, and everyone just laughed up, get off. It, it, it should have been held to uh, accountability. Where did you get that information? Okay, so. This is an excerpt from a much a longer poem that I wrote uh, about my activities three weeks ago that was a rather bizarre week. So this is at 7.30 p.m., I'm at my local town hall as, as a poet lord of the town of Yorktown. I uh, I read the poem at every public meeting of the town, well, generally every two weeks. At about 8, 8.30 p.m., I read a poem uh, standing at the podium about the Buffalo Massacre. Then as I approach the end of the poem, I feel my legs begin to wobble. I sit down, and they seem to be getting worse. So I left a little early and drove home, and after parking, Walk like a man very drunk toward my house, only making for a patio chair. My wife, the saint of Barbara, came out to rescue me and, and insisted we go to the hospital. At about 10 p.m., we arrived at NYP uh, Hudson Valley Medical Center, where we'd spend the next six hours. Six hours? We go into the ER and check in. Orderly put me in the bed, then wheel me down a hall. And the tiring, wonderful, almost overwhelming procedure begins. I get the chest x-ray, an EKG, more blood taken from me than I ever knew that I had. The blood reports came to my phone almost immediately before I spoke to a doctor. The C-scan of the head. And then I see the doctor. All is normal, other than high blood sugar. If that caused the wobbleness, you can go home. So we do at 4.30 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you brought candy this time. It was very impressive. Everything, the efficiency at the hospital was just terrific. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'm glad you're well. Careful. Careful. <laughs> and the only reason it took so long was they they don't they wait for the results of the tests before they go to the next one. Mm -hmm. But it was terrific. Thank you, Mr. McMullen. All right, we're going to go to courtesy of the floor. Okay. Remind everyone every time. You don't have to wait to courtesy the floor. If you have a problem or a concern that you need to raise with the town, you can contact the supervisor's office directly at 914-962-5722, extension 200. You can contact the clerk's office. You can contact any of the town board members, and all their contact information is found right on the town's on the website. As a reminder, for courtesy of the floor, there is a three-minute time limit. Please, when you come to the podium, introduce yourself. Uh, and as we've just, once again, uh, were reminded... Uh, civil discourse is greatly appreciated, uh, and and we ask, as always, that you keep your comments respectful uh, to the board and to our community. We'll invite whoever wants to come up first. You just, you just, yeah, yeah. Take your time. Yep. You need help, Tom? Yeah, I need three minutes to get up. <laughs> <laughs> take your time. Three minute limit on getting up. <laughs> It's great, to, count. It's great to see you, Mr. Grasso. Oh, Tony, okay. the buzzer just went off. I don't know what that's all about. You're out of time, Tony. <laughs> anyway, uh, this past weekend, my daughter Donna invited us up to Norwalk to witness the wall that heals. This is a wall that's circulating throughout America to build a wall in Washington or wherever they want it for the people who fought and left, they lost their lives in Vietnam. So I picked up the literature. So as members of the town board, you can look at it. Mm -hmm. If you would like to have it here in Yorktown as it travels, uh, it needs three acres in order to spread out. Wow. With it, there is a vehicle mm -hmm. that's put up on stilts and they have displays throughout the vehicle. It is extremely impressive. And if we're going to teach young people the results of wars, please think about it. Those of us that went through it, it brings back memories. Mm -hmm. It knows how I feel on the Holocaust. Why? Because I went through one of those buildings. Mm -hmm. As a young 80-year-old, okay. I saw it. 
It still bothers me at the age of 95. Yep. And I want young people to understand what's going on today. They better pay attention to it in our schools. I had a rumor today, but I will not talk to anybody about it except you, Matt. Okay. You have time? You want to stop by? Yeah. We'll have a conversation on that. Very good. But please consider this. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And we have the space. We have many ball fields that for a few days it could be taken out of use yeah. for something like this. For the people who gave you your freedom. Yes. Keep remember that it is not free. 100% correct. Thank you. It's well said, okay. Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grasso. Can I just add one comment to that? Sure, Jenny. Oh, <clears throat> My name is Jenny Minton. I just want you to know our two great-grandchildren were with us, a six-year-old and a five-year-old. I thought, and these two are not quiet ones. They're really rambunctious. Not one peep was heard from them the whole time that this gentleman spoke and the whole time that we were in front of the wall. So it's... McHenry, it, it was very, I was shocked. It was very impressive. And then he was, the six-year-old was given a card for him to write something. Everybody was given a card for him to write something on there that he thought about it he would like to do. When I left him in Norwalk the other day, he was still writing on that little card. Hmm. So it's very impressive even to the little children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Jenny. Jenny. Hmm? Beautiful. Next. I'm slow getting up. No, also. take your time. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> a little faster than you, but I hope I get to 95. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening, Susan Siegel. Okay. Uh, there are a few issues I'd like to just bring up, and I'd like your comments on them. Okay. Uh, the first one is the fluoridation project. Has the Westchester County Department of Health signed off on the project? Um, and are we now finally having the, our water fluoridated? Finally. But if not, I'm urging you to hold back on the resolution that's on the agenda, okay, Re releasing some, some retainage for the contractor. Please don't release the money until the, you know that the contractor is finished and has met all Department of Health regulations. I've been bugging Mr. Siarsa about this for weeks, so I don't know what the current status is, okay? Uh, second item is the change to the Part 3 concession agreement also on the agenda. I'm asking you to hold off on passing the resolution until you can explain why it appears that you're giving the operator virtually blanket permission to hold large special events on the site plus the construction of new buildings without any requirements, simply like needing a special permit, similar to what you've been discussing for the special permits, special events at the farms. Why do you appear to be treating the PAR-3 differently than the farms? Also, can you clarify why the delay in collecting the concession license fees? Will the delay in payments to November uh, only be for the restaurant or also for the golf because they are two separate concession fee arrangements? And if so, why the difference? And why can't you start collecting the fees as soon as they begin operating? Why do you have to wait until November? Third item is the energy projects. When is the board planning to adopt the local law that opts the town out of the state law that exempts solar projects, solar and battery projects from, from local taxes, but gives you the town the option for negotiating a pilot agreement, which I know is what you want. I'm asking because the operator of the battery storage facility on Goma Court has already applied to the county IDA for, for certain IDA benefits and as part of his submission, has submitted a draft pilot agreement. But Yorktown can't have a pilot agreement until you do the opt-out law. Um, another issue, this is more for the town attorney. What is the town doing to collect the, um, the unpaid taxes for the people on the 2019 foreclosure list? And why isn't the town being more aggressive about either getting the property owners to pay their taxes or foreclose on the property where the court has already given the permission. Let me add that th those, that's a 2019 foreclosure, which means taxes that haven't been paid prior to 2019. This has nothing to do with people who are suffering because, because of COVID. 
one homeowner on that list hasn't paid taxes since 2006. Should I repeat that? 2006, and the property owner owes over half a million dollars. Another one owes, a commercial property owner owes over $450,000, hasn't paid since 2011. Thank you, Thank you, my calculations, Thank you, Ms. Siegel. 18 property owners on that list. Thank you, Ms. Siegel. More than $2.4 million. Please, what are you doing to collect them? Thank you, Ms. Like Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good evening, Howie Frank. You're all time, uh, President. I'm glad to see you addressing the uh, water meters. Uh, are we going to get any money back from the town of Summers, Cortland? Now, we have a direct connection into the uh, town of Cortland where they have 38 uh, streets. Mm -hmm. I think there's about 100 uh, homes, and uh, they should pay their share of uh, have that water tank in Mohegan uh, cleaned up. Furthermore, the uh, commercial meters that we're using, I don't believe they're being uh, read properly. Uh, I've never seen any uh, with the water report that came out. Uh, they didn't address uh, the joint uh, operation between Summers and uh, Cortland as far as the water. And I know you had a dispute with the fluoride. So uh, what did they, they put a legal notice in their uh, town website, the town of Cortland. Is there any problem you have with the water blame? Yorktown. So I just want you to be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Frank. Good to see you back. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Hello. Judith Stavins. Hello, and Judith. And I'd like to address two things. Hi, everyone. First of all, um, and they're two separate things. First of all, as a member of Temple Beth Am in town, I want to thank you very much for the presentation and uh, the anti-Semitism proclamation. I will say that we have had to make many changes at our temple to the way we operate. Um, we're not a wealthy temple. We don't have, you know, armed guards standing outside, but we have had to put a lot of funds into security and training and, and the like, and it has had a significant impact uh, right here, right here in Yorktown. And second of all, also thanks for the Race Amity pro Proclamation. Uh, we are having, we are celebrating the um, annual Race Amity Day Festival on Sunday the 12th. Uh, this is an annual celebration. It's our fifth, um, and it's going to take place at Somers Library, hopefully outdoors. That's our plan. Um, it's a bring your own picnic at 1 o'clock. And then at 2 o'clock, we will have some presentations and speakers. And mostly time to, you know, hang out with friends and uh, talk with one another. So thank you. Thank you. Thank Judith. you. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Good evening, Supervisor Slater and members of the town board. Sarah Wilson, 31-year resident of Yorktown. Thank you for your proclamation this evening, recognizing June as Gay Pride Month here in Yorktown. In your proclamation, you mentioned that on June 11th, a demonstration will be held to celebrate the LGBTQ members of our community and to continue our collective efforts to ensure equality, freedom, and rights of all are, he are protected, preserved, and advanced. I'm here as a member of Yorktown for Justice. Uh, to provide some additional details to our residents about the activities that will be happening on June 11th and encourage our residents to join us for one or more of the events this coming Saturday. Our Pride March will step off promptly at 1 o'clock from here, Town Hall. No speakers, just a gay Pride March through downtown Yorktown, ending up right where we start here at Town Hall. After the march, we invite everyone to join us on the grounds of the Yorktown United Methodist Church, which is right across from Yorktown Police and Courthouse. Mm -hmm. Beginning at 3 p.m., we'll have a variety of speakers, performers, representatives from local businesses and organizations, food, games, and activities for the kids, tweens, and teens, and adults. Mm -hmm. And then we'll wrap it up at, by 6 o'clock where we can head over to the Yorktown Grill 
for a Pride After Party hosted by our own Anthony Calby. Yorktown Grill will have a bunch of food and drink specials. And then you can stay and watch the Rangers play <laughs> game six of the playoffs beginning at 8 o'clock. <laughs> She's got it so all. She's some, got it all. She's something all. for everyone, yeah. and we hope that you'll join us for one or more events. And if I still have 30 seconds left, I'll pivot quickly to another topic. All the plants are in the ground at the Garden of Pope at Willow Park. So great, great effort by the volunteers. But now our focus is on installing deer fencing. <laughs> and <me>. Oh, God. <laughs> And Parks and Rec has done a great job helping out by putting all the posts in the ground, but we need a crew of people to help actually erect the seven-foot-high, whatever, uh, deer fencing. Uh, We haven't set a date yet, but this is just a call out to our residents. If you're interested in helping us, either go on the Facebook page for Yorktown Garden of Pope or um, send an email to PJ Silverman. That's Papa Juliet Silverman, all one word, at gmail.com. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Thank you Sarah. Sarah. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, Supervisor Slater and board members. Uh, Mel Tansman, 31 year resident of Mohegan Lake in Yorktown. As always, my appreciation for your courtesy and your attention and also for your commitment to the principle of freedom of speech. There are many things I'm thankful for, and tonight the board's attention to human rights, anti-discrimination, and condemnation of hate speech in reaction to troubling incidents in our towns and neighboring communities is commended. Last month's resolution in response to hateful graffiti to commission a unity mural is one example of an affirmative affirmative, excuse me, action. I hope the town will benefit from the wise counsel of the Arts and Culture Committee in determining the best location, message, and community participation, including youth, in the design of it. As our children have had the benefit of an ever more diverse community and school system, their guidance and ideas should not only be welcomed, but really valued. Tonight, there are three, there have been three proposed resolutions that the board was considering. One recognizing Pride Month, one recognizing Race Amity Day, and, and the work of Race Amity of uh, Northern Westchester and Putnam, and a third enacting a policy that comprehensively defines anti-Semitism and commits to fighting it. As a person of Jewish heritage, I appreciate this effort. As an advocate, a human rights advocate for all, I hope that similar comprehensive consideration will be given to other ideologies of, of discrimination and hatred, including racism, xenophobia, homophobia, ableism, and Islamophobia. You know, resolutions are really an excellent first step. However, we really need to have more discussions around these specific areas that um, to really help have some change in our community. Thank you for your courtesy tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Motion Motion. to close courtesy of the floor. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm -hmm. No. Comments? Uh, Mr. Grasso, I I know that the, uh, it might not be the same wall, but the traveling wall, which is the Vietnam Wall Memorial, will be coming to Putnam. Carmel, yeah. Uh, Carmel. Thank well, you. At, at, yeah, at the at the veterans uh, the veterans uh, park. Uh, Jenny, can you hear me? Or all right. So if you tell t- uh, Tony, but uh, a few years ago, we actually took a group of seniors from the country house with the Sons of the American Legion, and we went there, and it was pretty amazing. Uh, they they really had a great time. And Mr. Grasso, since you come to those meetings with me, we'll make sure we go again this year. Uh, in addition, um, you know, on the honor flight uh, this past, uh, well, actually it's two weeks ago now, we got the opportunity to go to the Vietnam Wall, and I went with uh, with two Vietnam veterans who were looking for their friends' names on the wall, and it was, it was uh, you know, pretty, uh, well, it, very, very moving, very emotional uh, to see someone, you know, reach out and touch his friend's name. Uh, that that perished in, in Vietnam was, you know, just... Um, the gentleman there said 
no, yeah, no, yeah, no, sorry, Jenny. No, it's okay, Jenny. So, so it's pretty amazing, and you can look up every name on the wall. There's a system to it, and at the traveling walls, they do have those books available. Um, you know, in in, uh, in addition, I you know, and we know that our temples are short on money uh, when when things come around, and I know that. Uh, yeah, we ha we have uh, Jerry in the back still, so we'll thank our Yorktown Police Department because they do step up their patrols uh, during the High Holy Holidays uh, to make sure that that our temples are kept safe. So thank you to our PD for that, and our our uh, wonderful Chief Noble who makes sure that that happens every year. Uh, and uh, Sarah Tom in the back has it on uh, on very very good information that there will not be a game six because it's rangers and five so <laughs> so so uh, you know he, he said that that they threw the game the other night and they're going to win the next two so they can take it at home so sorry about that <laughs> there'll be some game i'm sure so um i have a um um baseball is back uh sarah uh, and judith um and so i have a tournament in philadelphia this weekend with with my uh one of my kids and so um if I'm, I'm hoping it gets rained out but if it gets rained out then it means you got you guys get rained out so i don't want i'm not praying for rain but i'm always up whether the rangers are playing or not for a calby party because they're legendary <laughs> <laughs> his party's a legendary i talked to him the other day and uh he's excited so i will try to make it but understand that i might not be in town yeah. Any comments from the board? Well, I, that's actually mine as well. I'm leaving on the on the tenth on. I'm going to Cape Cod for a wedding. Just my husband and I. Whoa. So I might send my kids and my mother, but it's just my husband and I. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Tony, for bringing not only the idea but also sharing the wisdom of like what other people are doing. And when it's called the Wall of Healing, it's just really powerful for me. I feel like the choices of words are impactful, so I really appreciate that. Um, Susan, I'm going to pass you on to Matt because I do know that we vetted for, to make sure that everything was okay with Westchester for the fluoride. I feel like the fluoride has been, at this point, my teeth are really white. Like, they're great because we talked about it so much. Um, as far as the unpaid taxes, I'm curious about that as well, and I know that we're looking into it. At this point, I think we are a little bit sensitive to what's happened in the world, and uh, um, we are trying to do it as diplomatically as possible. Um, Thank you, Mr. Frank, because it's true. We do share those barrels with other people, and those other towns should equally contribute on the well-being of the tanks. Um, and Mel, I think, has left. Mr. Tansman, thank you for acknowledging that we are doing one step at a time and moving forward. Anything you want to add? Very nice. Um, well, I think Kenny is here. He'll be able to oh, speak. Yeah, I'll bring Kenny up. He'll be able to speak on the uh, on, on on the water, and uh, Dan is here on the. We can have him speak on yep. the fluoride. So, okay. um, that's about it. And I had spoken to Tony earlier today about the the wall, and I think I'm going to make some phone calls, Tony. I'm going to see if we can find three vacant acres around here. I'm pretty sure we have it. Got plenty of open fields. Yes, we yeah, do. We do. The other thing uh, uh, regarding the the wall. Uh, that I'm going to be working with Councilman Lachterman on and the uh, Veterans Committee. It came to our attention, thanks to Councilman Diana, who's been leading the charge in recognizing our Vietnam veterans, uh, that we don't have one memorial dedicated to every member of Yorktown who unfortunately gave their life in Vietnam. Lakeland has one set. Yorktown has a second set. There's not one unified memorial that we can go to to recognize them all collectively. And so... Uh, I think it's about time that we fix that. And so working with the Veterans Committee, that's something that we're going to look to do. Also recognizing uh, uh, people like David Fahey and Clay Carpenter uh, who lost their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are two projects uh, that I'm looking forward to working with Councilman Lachterman on and the, and the Veterans Committee. Uh, in addition to bringing something like this to town, which would be fantastic. Uh, but we'll also provide the details. I'll get them from Carl Rohde, who's spearheading it up in Putnam County for the moving wall, which they're bringing uh, up to uh, up to Carmel. Uh, and if you haven't been to the Veterans Memorial Park up in uh, up in Carmel, uh, it is spectacular. Uh, I brought my kids up there actually uh, over Memorial Day weekend, and it's a real treat. So uh, that's where the moving wall will be. Um, Mr. Frank, the water meters, well, as you know, overdue. 
the commercial meters, I know that our water department's been working on the, uh, the commercial meters, implementing our process to make sure they're properly inspected, uh, as we've discussed in, uh, before. As for Joint Waterworks, they're not... I propose to Joint Waterworks that we all replace our meters simultaneously because we would actually save considerably because of our buying power. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the other members didn't feel as obligated to do so. Uh, so we are doing this on our own. Um, I hope that they uh, take advantage sooner than later. Um, but no, this is a this is a specifically a, a town of Yorktown project. As for their notice, uh, I do know for a fact that the town of Cortland, the Montrose Improvement District, was adamantly opposed to the fluoride project, and so that answers to the question about why they were posting that on on their town's website. Uh, yet we continue to move forward with the fluoride project. Dan and, and Kenny, you guys want to come up, and we'll we'll just talk real quick about the fluoride project because I know Dan. You've been in touch with the Department of Health as recently as today. So if we can just give a quick update on that. Um, yeah, the quick update is um, we've got two contractors on this, an electrical contractor and a general contractor. To speak to one of the comments, the electrical contractor is 100% done. The general contractor has had a changeover of personnel and there's just been it's it's just been maddening at this yep. point trying to get the last parts of this done. Okay. So if they to do the testing with the health department, which is the last thing, if they're not there next week, we're just going to do the final connections and and do the test and you know it's just going to at this point it's what we got to do because we got to just get the health department to sign off on it. Yep. Okay. I don't know if you had anything. Kenny, anything you want to add on this? So right now there is no fluoride in the town of Yorktown water. I just want to make sure we're clear. So there is no there is no fluoride. It's not hooked up yet, right? It is not hooked up yet. It has not been approved by the Department of Health, but our engineers telling us by the end of next week if the necessary uh, completion isn't uh, done by the contractor, we'll be doing it ourselves so we can get that inspection, final inspection done. Yep. Kenny, anything you want to add? Yeah, I'd just like to add also, uh, before the fluoride starts to get injected into the, to the water, the residents and everybody will have a lot of information out there. We're not just going to turn it on. Uh, there'll be announcements in online in the newspaper wherever we yeah uh, maybe we could do something with the town board at a work session yep but, uh, we will certainly make an announcement great thank you very much appreciate that both thank you so Dan I just want to make sure just so we can very clearly state for the record that the question regarding holding off on the resolution for the con for the electrical contractor we are 100% positive we can we have, move forward with that. We have that. no dispute with them. They've, okay. done, they've done their work. Their work is completed. Completed. There's no issues. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. It's just the hookup. Uh, as for, so there's, there's the uh, fluoride project. As for the uh, renewable energy, the previous town board had discussed this uh, with, the, with our assessor, and we are, in fact, in, able to accept the pilots. Our assessor's already been working with Borrego. Our assessor's already been working with uh, a number of renewable energy companies that are trying to bring projects into Yorktown regarding their pilots. So we're already in a position to accept said pilots. So we don't have to revisit that because the previous town board already made that decision. Um, uh, as for unpaid taxes, the town attorney is working through the in-rem list. Uh, he is contacting uh, property owners who have not paid their taxes. We recognize that. Um, we are past that COVID point, we believe. Uh, the courts are now hearing these, yeah. finally, because they were not hearing them for a number of years at one point. It was two years of COVID. They weren't hearing them, correct? That's correct, yeah. yeah. So we are reengaged in that process. As for the Part 3 agreement, uh, I don't believe, uh, I respectfully disagree with the statement that we are treating them differently than the farms, because if you read through the specifics uh, that are stated within, there are all laws, necessary approvals have to be obtained. Anything they want to do, whether it's lighting the golf course, installing an outdoor grill, providing outdoor activities, they need to follow. They're not limited to. Maybe. They need to follow the laws and get the necessary approvals, whether that's from the building department, the planning board, the planning department, the engineering department, Parks and Rec Commission. So uh, I respectfully disagree with that statement. Uh, and in fact, I think that we are holding them uh, incredibly ac accountable to the town and not giving them a carte blanche. Uh, uh, you know, blank canvas to just do whatever they want on the property. We're recognizing again in here, uh, if you would continue to the um, last point, uh, in addition to all the 
checks and balances that are in place here for the golf course, which I just want to make sure that we all understand. We are very excited to welcome the golf course and see it finally operating. I get questions about it on a daily basis. Uh, so the town, I think the town board is very excited to see this operate, to see it succeed, open. Yeah. open. I know Frank's in the back. Uh, Frank, we can't wait to be out there with you. Um, and But you also see that, you know, RC will pay the fines in connection with the DEC notice of violation issued on or about February 5th, 2020. So they're all they're up they're holding up their end of the bargain, and we're just making sure that everyone has a clear understanding of what the expectations and rules of engagement are for those future enhancements to the property that may or may not come. Uh, and so I don't think they're being treated any differently than the farms. In fact, I some could even make the argument that they're being held even more accountable. So. Um, but we are looking for forward to that uh, to that opening. July fourth is what they've uh, intimated to the town. For the golf and the restaurant, is it? And so, well, we'll wait and see. But we're hopefully that we're going to be swinging some golf clubs over at the par three golf course. I mean, the resolution just clearly states that uh, they they have to go through the necessary approvals like everybody else. I right. mean, it's just yeah. And why why wouldn't anybody have to do that? All right, it, that that applies to everybody in town. And, Mm -hmm. Right. So we're treating a town property exactly the same as any other yeah. con uh, any other applicant. Um, just seeing if there's anything else. Uh, let's see. No, I think that's it. That's it. Is, um, well, I had a question. Uh, uh, parades, rain or shine? Yes. Rain or shine. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was my only question. Thank you. Okay. I believe so. She's <laughs> we can get some really great... It's supposed to rain, right? Eh? Yes, I think it's supposed to rain. All right, so we're going to move forward. <clears throat> uh, personnel, we're going to appoint Stephen Nespolini to the position of library clerk for the John C. Hart Memorial Library, and we will appoint Tamara Hyman to the position of library clerk for the John C. Hart Memorial Library. Motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Volunteer boards and committees, we had a ton of people, uh, which was amazing to see. Um, so many people come out who are volunteering, want to get engaged with our community. So we have another round of appointments. We're going to be appointing Eric Peterson, Liz Scully, and John Angie as members of the newly formed Accessibility Committee. We're going to be appointing Bob Phelan as a member of the planning board. Bob has served previously on the planning board, so we appreciate and welcome his expertise back to the table. We're going to appoint Bob Waterhouse as an alternate member to the planning board. Uh, there was a name left out here. We're going to be appointing Minnie Deneen, Carrie, uh, and Brian D. as members of the Conservation Board. We will appoint Serafina Mastro, Deborah Marks, and Francis McVetty to the Senior Advisory Committee. We have a motion. motion. So, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now we will move to public hearings. Uh, we do have two public hearings. We're going to begin with the Hallux Mill Sewer District Extension. The clerk will show... The notice. In the meantime, Dan Ciarcia, please join us at the podium. There's the notice. And Dan, can you just explain once again? We did, we have taken this up before, but we were finalizing details. So if you want to explain why we're doing this one more time. Okay. Well, t tonight's uh, the culmination of a long journey. Um, so this is the last uh, resolutions. Hopefully, we've got to do on this before it. Uh, heads on up to Albany and to the office of the state controller. Um, so there have been some twists and turns along the way. And um, at this point, what's, what's the, the notable things that have happened is that we finally got, uh, although we got all the requisite uh, signed petitions at the end of 2019, we hadn't secured the funding, which was really the basis for the numbers that we represented to people that the $14.3 million project cost uh, didn't work if we didn't have the $10 million from the East of Hudson Fund. Right. So those funds are finally been secured. And more recently, uh, we, we um, secured $1.2 million through the efforts of uh, Congressman Mondaire Jones. Yep. So now our 14.3 went to 4.3 and now is down to 3.1. So that's officially the amount we're looking to finance. Um, went through this with Bond Council. We've done a couple of tweaks to the, uh, the number of parcels, which originally started, um, I believe, around 600 and evolved down to the 315, which was what was in play at the time of the, the petitions were circulated. And basically some refinements were done 
you know, such as uh, small strips or uh, uh, parkland. town parkland. So there were clearly some parcels that shouldn't have been on the list. So we've subsequently cleaned up the list, and now there's 310 properties okay. that are the subject of our application to the state controller's office. Very good. Very good. And so uh, this is a public hearing to establish the Hallett's Mill Sewer District Extension for those 310 parcels. Correct. Very good. Any questions for our town engineer before we open it up? Mm -mm. I, I want to thank uh, Dan. He did hold a, a helpful, I think, information session that occurred last week. We had approximately 30 people there. You were there. Sergio was there. Uh, I think we got to remind everybody about the project, where we've been, where we're going, what the goal is. And the video's up on the website, yep. so if anybody that couldn't attend you wants to see what we talked session. about and see the, the questions that were asked, because I think some of the same questions, you know, even in the audience, I think we heard a lot, of, you know. Yeah. But, but, you know, we tried to get to, some of the things are difficult to answer, like exactly how much somebody's connection is going to cost, because there's going to be 310 point. different stories of how right. that's going to be accomplished. But we are going to make every effort um, to reduce uh, the number of pumps that are required uh, to get everybody connected. Uh, it's clearly a goal and something that won't be realized until we get into the detailed engineering. So just one more time, we, we get through the establishment of the district. Application goes to uh, the state comptroller. Uh, the state comptroller approves. We come back. And at that point, we're going to be doing. A, uh, we're going to be bringing on a consulting art, uh, engineer, who's going to get into the granular level of each parcel. Cor correct. Yeah, correct. The, the, we'd be working toward getting the the, the actual documents that will go out to bid. There'll be visits to people's houses to see where their plumbing is, and you know the decisions to basically come up with the most cost effective yeah. way of sewering them, whether we make the the house uh, the pipes deeper or whatever it's going to take, but. You know, that sort of granular information doesn't really happen until we've um, got our consultant on board. But that, that would be uh, the first step. Once the, the district is established, then we can, the district can basically pay for that consultant mm -hmm. because it's a special district charge that really needs to uh, be tracked separately um, so that only the people benefiting from that improvement uh, uh, are paying for it. And the, and the other big difference from where we were to where we are is now uh, the town is going to be furnishing the pumps for those residents that it's determined to need a pump uh, system, correct? Well, the, 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 I guess one source of confusion is the pumps and the differences between them. That some of the pumps are going to be the low pressure pumps where the town opted not to put gravity sewers in the street. So those pumps we're going to pay for but that's really part of our collection system. Right. Separate from somebody who may have a lot that's way below the street and any, you know, that we can't put the pipe 30 feet into the ground to accommodate one property. Right. That person will have to put in a pump. But from their house to the From street. their house, which is a, uh, it was a separate sort of pump scenario. Right. That's, that's not something the town is paying for. We're only paying for it where we're not doing gravity <coughs> sewers. So the, 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 pump that, uh, the pump that's going to be pumping into the low pressure system directly, right, that's the one that the town will be paying for. Any other pump, for example, I think the example you used was if you had a basement uh, bathroom, like an ejector pump or something like that, like a very simple kind of thing like that, that would be, you know, so I think if, that would be uh, a cost to the, uh, the, the property owner. The pump that's pumping into the low-pressure system, that's the one that the town will be paying for. The town is going to be making its best efforts to avoid using pumps to try to get it, people into gravity-fed. I believe you explained that sometimes that's not just, just not going to be possible, um, but we're going to make our best efforts to do that. And I think a bigger, a, a one of the bigger, biggest, another big question was the cost to the property owner and... Pretty much once the assessment gets done and everything comes back and we have the consultant come in, we will be notifying each individual property owner of the cost to connect so this way they can make a decision before, no, no, before I mean, we go into connect. We won't be notifying them of the cost to connect. We will be, that's really going to be on them and their plumber to do the final 
connections. Our, our role is going to be to try and figure out where the plumbing is, try and get our system to accommodate them by gravity being the preferred option. Um, but uh, so, so I'm sorry. So then let me rephrase. The cost to get the sewer line to the point where they could get their plumber to connect, mm -hmm. that's what they'll be notified prior to the town doing any work. Is that accurate? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And, and the, 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 the distinction, you know, and maybe what clarifies it, is the health department views whether it's a gravity sewer or one of these low pressure systems where so instead of putting a gravity pipe in the street you're putting a pressurized pipe the pressurized pipe doesn't is it of no use to you if you don't have a pump to pump into it so the the county health department views that as part of the public system so that's the distinction between you know how we we serve property owners in the end we're providing a place at their property line where they can connect to the the public system and the final connection to that place is on them but the installation uh, for that location they will be notified that because that was a question that yeah, and, and generally okay. you know we'll survey their property and yep you know and even while it's ongoing you know we get more information where people yeah, sometimes don't wake up to the fact until we're coming down the street and then they say right, you know yeah. you said you're gonna put the pipe on this side of my house I talk to my plumber he wants it on that side Fine, we'll put it on that side. Right, right, right. Okay. Mr. Good. Supervisor? All right. Dan, just real quick, can you just go over the, the I guess it would be cost per household for, these are some questions I got after the, the meeting, um, for sewer tax, et cetera. Sure. Um, and I know there was an $800 fee, and then there was like a Fourteen hundred dollar well, fee. Well, basically, I think. The, basically the way it breaks Five. down is that um, we're a little different than the county because the county, if you're in the district, you pay the full freight whether you're connected or not. Right. So in our case, you, it's it's two part. You're gonna if you're in the district, you're gonna pay the freight specifically for the collection system, mm -hmm. which originally when we did the map plan and report. We were at seven hundred and eighty two dollars. So now in light of the additional grant that we got, that annual tax right now is at five seventy nine. So that's so everybody in the district will pay that regardless of whether they're connected or not. Mm -hmm. However, those people um, will not pay the costs associated with running the wastewater treatment plant, which we collect some of it through tax and some of it on their water bill. So um, Basically, we break that out um, to about $572 thereabouts. It changes, but that would be your annual additional tax you pay if you connect, mm -hmm. plus about 140 bucks to uh, on your water bill. 1200 roughly 1200 Yeah, so, yeah, you're about $1,200. Approximately. Approximately. For somebody that's okay. connected the whole nine years. Yeah, months. somebody that goes full freight. the system, you're looking at all in about 1200 annually. Right. And about 580 if you're not right 580 regardless because you're still paying off the debt right for the system itself and it's people who were in the original Halix Mill district which was established to build the plant if you're not connected to sewer you're paying zero to that <coughs> okay so these people were in that category and they'll continue to pay zero to that unless they connect however they will be sharing the cost of these sewers now these lateral sewers which will bring the service to their property mm -hmm. okay thanks Dan all okay. right then we will open up the public hearing for the Halix Mill sewer extension just come to the podium and if you could just provide your name for the record Is that easier? thank you Dan uh, I'm in the Halix Mills district. Do I have to pay anything more? That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. <laughs> I've Good been question, through three Mark. of these already. Yeah. Dan, do you want to answer? Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Why don't you provide that answer for people? So if you're not one of the 315 parcels and you're in the Halix Mills sewer district, are you paying? You're, you're not subsidizing this. The, the flip side of it is that our operational charges shouldn't go up that much 
So it's actually putting more people in the pool to help defray the cost of running the plant. So there may actually... But, there, but there's no immediate impact to right, Alex Hill Sewer right. District members this, who are not... It's, a, it's a special <laughs> district. The funds are segregated, so... so simply for them. Exactly. For the Thank 315, uh, 310... 310, sorry. They're paying the freight on this that the people in the existing Halix Mill District okay. are not. Okay. Next. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Frank. Hi. Good evening again, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> Well, I'm a 62-year resident of Yorktown. I moved in at age 23. And, uh, so, I'm so let me see. You, were, you, were, as good as you were 23, you were here 62 years, and now you're uh, plus, 24? Uh, <laughs> anyway, it was a wrong struggle when I moved in the 60. Anyway, I had a, a sewer installed, and, and we went through the whole uh, deal, and uh, my sewer was installed in, in district... Uh, uh, number two, uh, so that's one of the objections I have. The Helix Mill uh, Sewer District on your first uh, uh, comment here does not have a number. Now, for accounting purposes, uh, I've been trying to find out all along, even from Pat Corporal, is there any excess money uh, in the uh, Helix Mill Sewer District? Now, they used to have the number on the tax bill, which sewer district you're in, and it's been eliminated. My question is, are you commingling the funds now if you're not going to have a number on this district? It has to have a separate budget line, and it's not on there. Separate district. Yeah, well, separate. So if you look at the, yeah, if you look at the, um, if you look at the budget, and Dan, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong, but if you look at the budget, each, each sewer district is listed in there, mm -hmm. right? So this will be a separately listed sewer district. And the other reason because, that, yeah. uh, and Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but the other reason that the, um, num that you said that you came as district two, but my sense is that you are no longer paying debt on the sewer. on the sewer system itself. Right. That's what's on your bill. And so that's that's, yeah. that's why there's no number associated with this one. This well, is just the Halix one. But you are commingling now number two with uh, the new district by uh, by hooking it into our present uh, Granite Springs Road uh, lift station on Granite Springs Road and Curry three, Street. The 310 uh, parcels will be taxed separate. This, they're separate and distinct. So there are 310 parcels that will be taxed for uh, the, the infrastructure installation and then the operation, separate aside from all the other Halix Mills Sewer District. But members. there's going to be a new uh, <clears throat> generating system and new hookups so you can hit, hook into uh, Sunrise Street. So you are in increasing the capacity and the maintenance. I spoke to Dan, and he's still waiting for the town board to give him some uh, direction as far as getting the uh, generators replaced. Over the years, even though in District 2, our lift stations like Granite Springs Road, uh, there's been all kind of problems. There's mm -hmm. been problems on uh, Walden Woods uh, where there's been overflows and terrible sewage spells, uh, spills. Walden Woods was, yeah. just, uh, was just completely renovated. Well, that was just done, I live, yeah. I live you about live 300 feet from it. But uh, the history the of uh, with all the extra flow that's going to be coming into the, the uh, lift station on Granite Springs Road. Anyway, these, uh, whether it's new or not, these lift stations uh, uh, have terrible history of uh, electrical failures. And uh, one of the reasons why they're hooking to the town grid, I spoke to you once about it, where uh, right now the, uh, they should have a priority as far as uh, uh, electrical uh, uh, pole connections to uh, these uh, lift stations. Right now, uh, like the Granite Springs Road and, uh, and your uh, area, the, uh, the primaries have to come from across 202, and they go across uh, Elizabeth Road, and they make a, a right and a left turn, they go into Sultana. Anyway, it's, uh, I measured it out. You're operating, or you will be operating, all these uh, lift stations and, and pumps with uh, a very... Uh, comparable uh, primary system with the electrical well, as far as failures go. When we wrote to uh, New York State Gas and Electric, they said, oh, there's no problem or anything like that. Anyway, if you measure the, uh, the, most, the shortest way of supplying uh, uh, primary power to the new district and the, is to uh, hook into the line on uh, Broad Street. It's a direct line. It goes right to the main feeders that come off the, uh, uh, the substation. And it's only one mile where you're feeding this new section 
will be fed by four and a half to five miles of uh, primaries. Over the years, I'm telling you, living there 62 years, every time there's been a power failure, I would get into my car and say, hey, let's see what's going on. And always uh, were uh, rotten poles falling down. So you're subjecting, subjecting all this new uh, lift stations that are going to go on on every street as far as uh, taking the waste from the people with the waste, with the people with the... Uh, uh, with the sewer grinders. Yeah, there's going to be pump stations? Yeah, yeah these, well, they're going to be lift stations. If it's a low pressure system, it has to have a pump. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, one of the things I would. concerned that it's going to take away from the productivity of what's existing at this moment? Uh, well, as far as the electrical capacity, it's, it's my opinion, New York State Gas and Electric has not uh, given us a, a, a primary that is. Uh, has enough capacity now to handle all those new uh, uh, lift stations safely. You may even want to consider uh, having them uh, put in the underground service for all these little lift stations that are going to go on on the streets. And a lot of those are little roads up there at Sparkle Lake, the poles are rotten. There's been numerous uh, electrical failures. So that's one of the things. We've uh, worked there, though, haven't we? We've oh, I think, uh, yeah, we'll get into it. So, uh, as far as the, uh, the basic electrical supply system for all these roads that are going to get substations uh, or lift stations, the homeowners are going to be having all kind of problems if you don't give them a good uh, primary electrical system. So I propose you can cut out uh, the, the switches on, uh, pole switches on Granite Springs Road down, down the street from uh, the guiding eyes. You can segregate that and close the switch on Broad Street, and all the, uh, the, the pump stations now will be uh, directly fed by uh, a primary that comes right off the, uh, the, the uh, substation uh, at the sewage treatment plant there, which is a high capacity. It's just been rebuilt. It's a huge, uh, if you look at the conductors and the poles on the Broad Street feeds, the only thing it really feeds is the Brookside School and up on Hedwick Drive and the area that you're going to be getting the new sewers up on the uh, street off of Broad Street. So the electric, the primary uh, service to all these uh, future subs, lift stations has got to be upgraded. But you're going to have a humongous amount of uh, problems every time there's a power failure. If you look at the history, I know New York State Gas and Electric won't give it to you, but if you look at the history of that particular feeder, that comes in off of uh, Elizabeth Road, goes up through Elizabeth Street and mm -hmm. down Grid Street, and there's been uh, over my 62 years there, there must have been 50 trees that came down, and we must have had 50 outages. Even though I have a generator in my house, anybody with a, a sewer ejector, you better have, a, in my opinion, you better have some backup uh, power. So. Uh, uh, I would uh, ask New York State Gas and Electric to look at the plans where you're going to have these uh, lift stations and tell them you want to have underground service and upgrade the uh, primaries coming in from Broad Street so you can cut out four miles of uh, feeders that are subject to uh, numerous tree failures. So uh, I would uh, notify New York State Gas and Electric now that uh, they did answer my letter Mm -hmm. They said, oh, there's no problem there. But if, I know from experience, if you look at the conductors on Broad Street and compare it with the services coming down uh, from Granite Springs Road and uh, Elizabeth Road all the way down across this 202, it's four and a half miles to five miles of primaries where we can cut it down to one, one mile. So I think the uh, New York State Gas and Electric should be put on notice that we're going to be uh, upgrading uh, everybody's uh, services. Also, uh, as far as notifying the people I listen to the meeting, uh, they're going to need uh, some electrical uh, work also, uh, proper grounding. You just don't put a, yeah, a sewage ejector in. Right, right. Uh, and uh, good, to good time to notify the people that even though you give them a sewer, hey, you better upgrade your uh, service from 150 to 200 amp and have it outside uh, yeah. Yeah, rain type box outside. and everything like that. So well, it, we're, we're still, we're still yeah. a long ways away from I know, from you're still a long ways away. But, but I, went, ways away from I know, it. but I went through that where you got to put the sewer spud. Very important. Once you put that stake in the ground yeah. and, hey, we're going to run the pipe there, 
Uh, you better take a picture of it because somebody goes say, hey, yeah, I want it 50 feet down. Right. Okay. Oh, thank you, God. Mr. Frank. Oh, we're going to make sure we have a nice plan. Right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Frank. Frank. Appreciate right, it. Dan. It's great to see you back in town. Just give your family my best. Anybody else who would like to uh, speak? Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Dave, Hello. Dave Humphrey. I'm a 36-year resident of Sparkle Lake. Um, uh, up there in our neighborhood, we've uh, the 36 years I've been there, we've been discussing the need for sewers the <laughs> whole time. Uh, this goes back, Only at 36? least in my personal participation, to the Linda Cooper administration That's and nice. everyone since. Uh, so we're very happy that we're reaching what we hope is a definitive yeah. uh, step to get this done. And um, thank you very much for picking up where past administrations had trod. Um, as it were. Also, um, as a uh, board member of the Sparkle Lake Homeowners Association, uh, we were happy to um, participate in the, partic the petition drive yes, that uh, was very successful. Did a lot of legwork up there, obviously, for our own benefit, but uh, it was very successful. And as you move forward, um, should you reach a step where we can be helpful again just want to let you know we'll be there thank all right thank much. you Dave. Thank you. we appreciate thank you. that thank you thank you so much and i think that was one of the things that i said on thursday uh this was a a project as you said dave that spans multiple administrations and you guys did a great job with the petition process and that was one thing we didn't want to have to revert back to and repetition so we continued no, the, the ball in the same direction that we that we were handed it and that's where we are today anyone else would like to speak on this matter Anybody else would like to speak on the matter? Public hearing establishing the Halix Mill Sewer District Extension. Motion. Hearing none. Motion, motion to close. Motion to close. Is this a roll second. call? Second. So we have a motion to close. We have a sec. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Now we have several approving resolutions that were drafted by Bond Council that we will go through. So. These will be roll, all of them will be roll call votes, correct, right. Madam Clerk? Yep. Okay. So, we will make a motion to approve making certain determinations in relation to and finding it to be in the public interest to establish a Halix Mill Sewer District Extension. Can I have a motion? S motion. Second. All in, uh, we'll do a roll call and we'll have the Town Clerk. Councilman Thomas Diana. Aye. Supervisor Matthew Slater. Aye. Councilman Edward Lachterman. Aye. Councilman Sergio Esposito. Aye. Councilwoman Luciana Howe. Aye. I was going to say you be, but I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next, we will approve the establishment of the Halix Mill Sewer District Extension. We'll have a motion. Motion. Second. We'll turn it over to our town clerk. Councilman Thomas Diana. Aye. Supervisor Matthew Slater. Aye. Councilman Edward Lachterman. Aye. Councilman Sergio Esposito. Aye. Councilwoman Luciana Howard. Aye. Calling me Edward, I feel like I'm in trouble. You are. You are always <laughs> in trouble. Edward, <laughs> Edward Arthur. <by> the way. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, last but not least, approve the application to the State Comptroller's Office in connection with the establishment of the Halix Mill Sewer District Extension. Motion. Second. Second. Madam Clerk. Councilman Thomas Diana. Aye. Supervisor Matthew Slater. Aye. Councilman Edward, Edward Arthur. Arthur <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Councilman Sergio Esposito. Aye. Councilwoman Luciana Howard. C. <laughs> all right. All three motions pass. Yay. Yay. Excellent. It's a big step. Aye. <laughs> Mr. Humphrey, as your new neighbor, I'm really excited about it all, so. <laughs> More than three decades in the making, so happy to be here. Well, it's the speed of government. Mo moving at a glacier speed. <laughs> Jeez, you're telling me. Okay. Switch. Next, we're going to go uh, have a public hearing. Open the public hearing for the increase in improvement of facilities of the Consolidated Water, dist water District at a maximum estimated cost of $1,811,683.62. The clerk has showed the notice. 
Uh, we have our water superintendent, Ken Rendell, here. Ken, you want to come to the podium real quick? Uh, as a reminder, this is uh, this is a public hearing for us to bond the 1.8 million that will help us fund the upgrade of approximately 4,500 water meters. Have a great night. 4,500 water night. meters uh, through the town of Yorktown. Finally, finishing the water meter upgrade that's been taking 10 years, 12, quite a few years. Good evening. It's almost 12, right? Yes. Uh, 12 years to finish. 10, ten years. 10 years to finish. Cool. It's thing. such a big occasion. Look at Kenny. He's all sharp. Kenny Look is, yeah, I know. He got dressed up. Uh, so, is, Ken, is there anything beyond that? I mean, we know that we're going to go, uh, why don't you explain this, you know, that we're going to continue the system that we're currently on. Okay. You want to just give us a high-level review of what, of what the system will be? Sure. Good evening. Uh, to echo Dan's words, this has been a long journey. Uh, the Water District started in 2000, I believe it was 2012, to install uh, water meters. We installed approximately 2,500 meters. Um, from there, they've been bits and pieces getting changed out. So we're up to about 4,500 or so. Um, so it, it's great that the town board would like to finish this project. Um, there's a lot of benefits to the residents. There's a lot of benefits to the district. There's a lot of benefits to the town. And um, I, I think it's it it's well overdue. Um, yes. Yeah. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. <laughs> and so and more. I just want to, I also want to thank our comptroller, Pat Caparell. Absolutely. Because the way that we're structuring this, there is a, it's a net, it's a, it's a net neutral impact on the water department's budget. Right. That which is a tremendous accomplishment to be able to do this without impacting your operational budget. Yeah, that's amazing. It's terrific. Uh, yes, I must thank Pat also because, um, like you said, it, it, it's really net-net on our budget. Um, and to get a project to this magnitude done with that without any impact to our budget it is, is, is fantastic. Pretty stellar. Kenny, can you just give us a, a – I don't know if you're speaking with our, our, our partners over there, but um, Cora Main – Assuming this all comes to fruition, how quickly are we going to see some action on this? This summer? Yes, I would say this summer. Um, I'm very excited, and Corn Maine is very excited to see what the board decides to do tonight. Um, I'm hoping that I can make a phone call tomorrow morning and say, let's start the ball rolling. Great. Um, but that's going to depend on, on the board. But I foresee meters going in over the summer. Absolutely. Over the summer. And how, and how long will it take them to do all 4,500? That's going to depend on their installers. What I'd like to do is if the board decides to move forward with this, um, I'd like to have Corn Main and their installers in for a work session for an introduction and a question and answer type thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we'd be able to get a better feel on that okay. um, at, at that time. Very good. Appreciate that. Thank what you. I, what I particularly like about um, uh, this the, this uh, decision uh, or path forward compared to the other options we had is we, we're really keeping this in house, you know, and we're keeping it with uh, with the, with the water department, and it's uh, you know that's that's what I really liked about it. So I'm um, I'm uh, I'm happy to do it. Great, you know. So with that, Ken, we're going to ask you to step aside for a few seconds, and we're going to open it up for public comment. Uh, for if you'd like to comment on the again, this is a bond for 1.8 million. That was all about the meters. <laughs> oh, look at Susan! <laughs> wow. <laughs> all I can do is say thank you to, to the five of you. Um, I was supervisor when this project started in 2010. We got it going in 11, and then it stopped. And while you talked about all the the late the missed years. I sadly think about the money that was lost to the district, mm -hmm. okay? Money that was due in a fair and equitable way. Well over a million dollars has just been lost because some board members just didn't want to do it. And I won't go into back history. I also want to thank you for deciding to continue with the core in Maine and not throwing out that and starting scratch, Over. which is something you discussed, the, pre the previous board discussed, which I thought was ridiculous. So, so thank you. Um, I do have one question, which I think you might have inadvertently answered earlier, and that's when you continue with this project, will you be including the commercial meters? 
it, it seemed like you weren't. No. Okay. No, because we've got a separate mechanism that the water department is implementing, has implemented, and is continuing to implement as it pertains to the inspection of commercial meters. Okay, okay which is another issue that I've been bugging board, boards about for years because we're losing millions of dollars and on our that. the water department is tackling it head so, on. I'd like an update from the water superintendent because the legislation that updated and put penalties in was passed, yep. I think it was just before COVID, yep. and previous boards did not want to impose oh. this burden on the owners. We have, we're since long past that. What I, I'd like a concrete update. How many letters have gone out? How many meters have been inspected? How many meters? I really want to see. I numbers. understand, and, but I respectfully <laughs> say to you, this is a public hearing on the water meters. Okay. So we will so, get you we'll that touch update. On that one. <laughs> okay. We will get you that update. Residential water Not meters. a problem, <laughs> but this is a public hearing on the water. And again, say. I, I say, I say, thank you, and go to it, and Kenny, go for it fast, fast, mm. fast, fast. Bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> thank you, Susan. Anybody else would like to speak on the water meters? Anyone else? Hello. Public hearing on $1.8 million for 4,500 water meters. Motion. Going once, going twice. We have a motion to motion close. Acted. We have a second from Councilman Lachterman. All in favor? Aye. 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 We roll call. need a roll call. You want a roll call on closing? No, I want a roll call vote on your adoption. Okay, so then we will make... We need all in favor, right? Okay. No, we, we will make a... So you want us to... We're closed. We close mm -hmm. the public hearing, so the motion <laughs> is... Madam Clerk? Adopt the resolution. I don't see uh, a resolution on there. We're just going to use the first part. All right. So then I'll, we'll yeah. make a motion to adopt uh, the resolution to. Uh, I'm sorry. To, to increase increase the increase and improvement of the facilities of the consolidated water district, consisting of the purchase and installation of approximately 4,500 water meters as well as costs incidental at a maximum estimated cost of $1,811,683.62. So I need a motion on that. On that. So moved. Second. And we'll do a roll, roll call vote. So Madam Clerk. Councilman Thomas Diana. Aye. Supervisor Matthew Slater. Aye. Councilman Edward Lachterman. Aye. Councilman Sergio Esposito. Aye. Councilwoman Luciana Howell. Aye. Very good. Kenny. Oh, Tony. Go forth and conquer, buddy. Can't wait. 4,500 meters right there. All right. We have something here on relining, though. No, not, no. not yet. Okay. Uh, folks, have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, all. Yeah. So next we have public hearing decisions, uh, and we're going to ask Dan C.R.C. to come back to the podium, please. This is regarding the stormwater pollution prevention plan and wetland permits submitted by Con Edison in order to do gas main upgrades and replacements at the following locations, including Lexington Avenue, East Main Street, and Broad Street. My question, Dan, East Main Street, where are they planning on doing this? Because I know that our highway superintendent is planning on paving portions of East Main Street. Um, they're they're going to be on um, Jefferson can. Valley and Shrub Oak, where as Shrub well Oak? as Route 6. Where in Shrub um, Oak? They'll be by Barger Street. Oh, um, there we go. It's 1.8 miles. I, I'd have to check the maps, but it is going into that section. Okay. Is what's he paving the Shrub Oak section? I think he's paving. He's over. Nah, eh, not really. Not not that portion of Shrub Oak. There's certain but sections. I, I forget where he told me. Sections of it off of. I believe it's near Sagamore. Yeah, probably to the high school where the pavement breaks up just right. past the high school, right, right. in that I, area. I'm not sure they're going that far, but. Um, is there any way I to can, get him like a map with like a color? I can. I can, I can no. Yeah, yeah. Well, we could do some of these, and I can go back downstairs and get the maps, right, and we, so we can, can do, answer let's, that. So let's make a motion to approve the Lexington Avenue. Yes. Uh, the Lexington Avenue, and as uh, we'll do Lexington Avenue and Broad Street. Oh, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. So if um, you can run downstairs and get me the answer on East Main Street, we'll continue with our business in the meantime. Uh, that's going to bring us to resolutions. Okay, uh, we already approved the anti-Semitism policy. Mm -hmm. Quickly, we'll make a motion to authorize the supervisor to execute a Civil Rights Non-Discrimination Act. And I just want to pull one section out of this so that the public understands what we're trying to do here. Um, so it states, among other things, this is a separate... There. Oh. 
<laughs> I might need that back, actually. No, that was oh, yours. Then. I have oh, okay. it. Right. You all have it. There and we it go. states, among other things, that the town of Yorktown is committed to maintaining, maintaining an agency which recognizes and values the inherent worth and dignity of every person, fosters tolerance, sensitivity, understanding, and mutual respect among its members, and encourages each individual to strive to reach their own potential. This, this policy would be placed on all Town of Yorktown's bulletin boards and made available to all organizations and entities doing business with the Town of Yorktown. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's a wonderful thing for us to be implementing. And we have a motion by Councilman Diana. Do we have a second? second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No, not at all. Fantastic. Okay. We will... Move on. Authorize the supervisor to enter into an agreement with Alliance for Safe Kids, Inc. for the provision of a community-based youth mental health programs and resources. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very much needed. Very much needed. Oh, my gosh. You want to group them together? Or you just want to go you want, uh, we, can group, uh, we can group the next couple together. Uh, we're going to authorize the supervisor to enter into a regional kitchen agreement with the town of Portland. Uh, that's for our senior, our senior nutrition yeah. center. As a reminder, our senior nutrition center cooks for Cortland and Somers. Uh, award a bid for three Ford Super Duty F five five five. Get it again. F five 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 fifty bid for the highway department. We're going to authorize the town clerk to advertise a bid for T-shirts and uniforms for the Parks and Recreation Department. We will authorize the supervisor to execute an agreement with the County of Westchester for the Wellness in Nutrition Program. Uh, wellness in Nutrition Program and Nutrition Services Incentive Program contract for 2022-23. We'll authorize the supervisor to sign an amended contract with Weston and Sampson for engineering services related to the rebidding of the cleaning and cement relining project. This is what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And authorize the town comptroller to transfer $40,800 yep. from budget code SW8340.0210 uh, to budget code SW8340.0490. Um, just as a... Brief, briefly, Kenny, just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, since we're rebidding, you want to come up to explain to the public. So since we're rebidding this portion, the previous work was only for Strawberry Road. This will get us ready to go to also include Hanover. That's correct, yes. That's the 40000 for the engineering and inspection fees for Hanover. Right? For Hanover. So they can get the, they get the documents ready to go out to bid and then they can and their Absolutely inspection to fees. rebid, yes. In our conversation, Kenny, they, they held their price on the, on the, on other. the other. So yes, that they was, did. you know, they, they were stand up about that. Yep. Great. Uh, we're going to authorize the comptroller to process a budget transfer for the payment of 2021 and 2022 invoices received. This is from BFJ for planning services for the proposed overlay district. $30,000. They held their price as well. Uh, authorize the comptroller to process a budget transfer for payment to the East of Hudson Watershed Corporation for the maintenance of ponds. This is mm -hmm. an annual. Authorize the release of retainage in the amount of $7,775.82 to Acorn Electric for contractual work completed for the fluoride project. Our engineer spoke to this and said they were 100% done. We'll authorize Barton and LeJudis to perform an environmental review. For the Grishash proposed subdivision. Mm -hmm. And let's stop there. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then lastly, we have the resolution regarding the Par 3 golf course uh, to provide recreational facilities to the public that will commence operation on July 4th, 2022. Dan, did you want to. Um, you want to do this one first? Okay. Which one is this one? This Lennox is Par 3. Par, uh, par 3 first? Or? Mm -hmm. Yep. So we have a, we'll make a motion to adopt for the Par 3 golf course, as, re, as, re, as I already stated, with the resolution. Approve Par 3 golf course, provide go, uh, golf recreational facilities to the public that will commence operation on July 4th, 2022. So moved. We're not taking public comment right now. Sorry. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Very good. Dan, back at you. East Main Street, where are we going? Yeah, which one are we on? East Main. Oh, sorry. What are they? What are they working on? Yeah, their their plans are a little confusing, but it looks like they're starting over by Coach and Four. All right, Jefferson um, Valley. And then they're kind of going down. Um, Public hearing. And jumping onto East Main Street. Right, but where on East Main Street? That's 
Well, I think it's Main Street. You're coordinating with the highway superintendent. Yeah, maybe you and Dave can. So I don't know if. Well, I, I mean, I, they're not at this yet, so I could. You don't have to do this one tonight. You want to I mean, hold this one if over? There's any urgency for it? We could. Yeah. We could. I think it makes. I don't think it matters about holding it over. I think it's more. Just... Oh, that's right. I don't think we should hold it over. I think that we should. Well, I, I think the bottom line is this is for the be, wetlands permit. Dave, Dave, Dave still has to issue. The work permit. I want to be reassured that there's going to be coordination with the highway department as it pertains to their paving schedule. That's all. That's all I want. Okay. That's yeah. the bottom line. Yeah. So he has to deliver to Dave a map with red ink showing. So can we just can we amend the resolution for East Main Street with a condition that the highway subject to uh, yes. highway work permit? Yes, yeah. 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 absolutely. This way we're not tearing up new pavement. Exa- it, it, that's down. exactly what I want to avoid. And we're, we're all in agreement with that. So with the res- with the amended resolution that requires consultation from the highway superintendent and a, and a, and a highway work permit. Yes. Yeah, and it looks like they'll need it from DOT as well. Okay. Does that work? Great. Works for me. Yep. Okay. Motion. Okay. DOT will Motion. Need it too. Second. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. No. Okay. Yeah. With that, I don't think there's any business before the board, so we will. Oh, excuse me. We'll have to make a motion to accept monthly reports from the final so receiver of taxes and a town clerk. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. A motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Well done, York. Good night, York. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good.